from here in Wellington, and our PNA um, Anne Brinkman is floating around somewhere. Um, I have an apology today from our chair, Helen Garrick, who is unable to attend due to a bereavement. So um, you'll have me emceeing today instead. So um, I'd just like to hand it over to Grant, please, to open with the karakia. Katangi titi ti, katangi ti kaka, katangi hokia ho ti hei mauri ora. Ko te tuatahi, uh, kei te mihi a ho ki ngā iwi o tēnei rohi, ko ngā ti tōrona tira me tāna ki whānui ki te upoko o te ika. Kei rātau te mana whenua i tēnei rohi. Kei tōtoko hia te kaupapa o tēnei hui, uh, ko te orana o te tangata. Nō reira, karakia tātou. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kine kine ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai. E hia kei anā te atākaro he tio, e huke he hauhu ti hei mauri ora. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things before we get to start. So um, if the building starts to shake or anything, so drop and hold. Um, if there's a fire siren going off, then the staff will come and direct us what to do. Um, bathrooms are just out the back door and in the corridor to your right, um, if you need those. Um, attendance certificates are going to be emailed out to registrants after the event, so they won't be available today. Um, and just a couple of other things that um, our second speaker, Harena McKenzie, um, contacted yesterday and unfortunately she's ill with a COVID-related illness and is unable to attend today. So despite our frantic attempts yesterday to try and find a replacement speaker, we were unable to do that. Um, so Teresa has kindly um, agreed to come and speak in her spot and we'll just finish a bit early. Um, so we apologise for that. She has said that she will make her talk available to us. She's going to record it. And um, once it is available, we'll send it out to people um, to be able to listen to that. Um, so as we know, capacity is a, a very hot topic within mental health at the moment, particularly around um, the replace and repeal of the Mental Health Act and what that might mean going forward and also that we know that the Triple PR Act is also under review at the moment. So two key pieces of legislation that affect mental health um, service delivery um, and will impact on our practice in one way or another. So we're delighted today to have Professor John Dawson to come and speak on the topic for us. So um, John is Professor of Law and Medicine at Otago University and Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak to you. It's lovely to be in Wellington. I've brought my golf clubs to play with a friend tomorrow, and I'm hoping it's not going to be a northerly gale. <laughs> Uh, in the heart. Well, our subject is the role of capacity principles in mental health law, and it's not an easy subject. Capacity is a very large subject, and the matters that I'm going to talk about you know, intersect very much with concerns people have about the capacity assessment process in, in general perhaps, and capacity assessment across cultures. Capacity is a fairly individualized focus on a person. The capacity of the individual has a fairly strongly kind of cognitive focus. Is there room for collective decision-making about capacity, a broader focus? There are you know, big and difficult cultural questions here in this, this space. Uh, I'm going to largely talk about it from a fairly orthodox um, legal point of view, based particularly on current legal principles, but they won't necessarily stay the same. We've got quite a lot of time here, about 
an hour and 15 minutes or even more if this uh, goes to the draw of a speaker, but an hour and 15 minutes on mental capacity law, probably <laughs> more than enough. Um, I might talk for about uh, you know, 40 minutes or so. Look, feel free to um, stick up a you know, hand or whatever or uh, post questions as, as we proceed, but I certainly hope we can have some serious discussion at the end. The implications for mental health nurses of these matters. I mean, I have a few <coughs> ideas here, the general kind, but you know, you're in a much better position to know what the detailed implications are going to be than a um, young lawyer trying to tell you about that. So <laughs> I'm very interested to hear actually what you have to say about that. Um, you know, to me, this is sort of sense like a research meeting to <laughs> uh, find out what your views are. So I am hope we can have a very good dialogue about that at, at the end, and I can learn from you. If you, you know, invite a law lecturer to give you a talk, that there's a grave danger that you will get a law lecture. <laughs> so uh, this will partly be that. And of course, I, I know it's probably variable knowledge within the room about um, the operation of the Mental Health Act and Triple PR Act, but probably a lot of you know a good deal about it and about um, <clears throat> the role of welfare guardians and people exercising enduring powers of attorney and so on, and law in the forensic field as well, and unfitness to stand trial, capacity to stand trial, as they call it in some other countries. And some of you may have you know, less experience, of course, and may work in contexts that are not so legalistic. Well, you know, my own experience in these matters comes mainly from, from research, uh, from studying the laws in the books, the legislation acted by parliament, decisions of the courts and tribunals, interpreting and applying those rules, particularly in difficult and marginal cases. And from research out in the field that I do as well, periodically in, in teams, with mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, multidisciplinary teams going out into the world and studying how the Mental Health Act does operate in practice, observing proceedings before courts or tribunals and interviewing them, different kinds of participants, interviewing compulsory patients about what they think about being under a community treatment order or their, their family and whanau or responsible clinicians and so on, studying psychiatric records did a study of um, the records of everyone who had gone through the second opinion process for ECT and medication lasting beyond two months, the second opinion process under the Mental Health Act, uh, and so on, and working in teams of this kind and writing it up. Well, particularly I've had a focus on community treatment orders, um, and over the course of my career, I'm getting on now. I mean, when I started in mental health law about 1982, all the large psychiatric hospitals were still open. Uh, first study I did of the committal process was in Carrington, Oakley, Kingseat, and Tokanui hospitals, all of which are now closed. And so it turned into something else. They have sheep grazing on their fields and so on. Uh, and probably that's a good thing, too, that they are closed, although you know, not everyone thought so at the time. Well, the transition to community care, deinstitutionalization, painful process in many respects. People died, 20 year process roughly. Um, that was all happening in the course of my sort of early and mid career. So, compulsory community treatment, intersection with human rights, uh, what it means to put a person under compulsory community treatment, how can it be uh, implemented in a manner consistent with human rights? And does it work? Does it make? Does it really work? Are people made? Does their mental health improve by being under compulsory community treatment or not? And these are very difficult and important questions to to research. Obviously, well, that's how I've learned about these things myself. But I'm not a mental health professional, and nor really am I a practicing lawyer. I don't represent people in mental health review tribunals or in the courts or try to break people out of forensic hospitals or. Think of that kind, although you know, I might try. Um, well, this is a you know highly topical subject, capacity law. Um, no doubt you're familiar with the general concept of capacity assessment. Um, this my slides here um, uh, are not right 
here, we probably need to, those are yours. Um, well, uh, they're, they're maybe down the bottom. Yeah. Um, Technological problems, <laughs> not unknown. Okay, can we read that? You're, you're okay, we're underway. Well, um, you know, I'm sure you're you know, generally familiar with the concept of capacity, but let me just start by emphasizing how you know, pervasive this concept is in the law. And it's, a, it's a sort of generic concept across numerous legal settings. And you can have legal tests and assessments about making a will, your capacity to enter a contract, capacity to stand trial, capacity to drive, capacity to hold a driver's license, Capacity to fly, would you believe? Capacity to hold a marine pilot's license. <laughs> Capacity to be an MP or a judge. There are constitutional rules about when judges can be sacked for lack of capacity. Uh, capacity to be a trustee of a family trust or director of a company and so on. This is a pervasive concept across the law. And you know, its general meaning really is you know, sort of the ability to perform certain skills or functions that are relevant to a particular context to a standard that is set by law. And the context then determines the relevant school, skills that you need. Frequently, they're going to be mental skills related to your ability to understand the information relevant to the particular task and to work with and use reason with that information. And to appreciate that it applies to your situation, that's relevant to you, and to make a decision that can be maintained with a tolerable degree of uh, certainty and continuance so that it can be acted upon by others and to communicate that decision. If you're completely unable to communicate, a decision that too could be a form of incapacity. So the many different words you know are used to describe the concept in the law. It's not always the term capacity, it might be competence. Competence, competency is a term we often use in the uh, in sort of Anglo-American law in, in the past. Capacity has now sort of entered the vocabulary, I think largely as a result of English legal system becoming integrated with the European legal system, the European human rights regime, and Europe they used to capacite, the French term, and now that European law, human rights law applies in England, they too have adopted this concept of capacity. But you know, capacity, competence, fitness, ability, all of these terms could be used it's a generic requirement for autonomous decision making across numerous legal fields. Self determination, your ability to make decisions is premised on you having the relevant capacity to reason about the information that is necessary to make tolerably informed decision in that field. And it's then necessary for your decisions to be viewed as valid or effective. If you don't have the capacity and you appear to make a decision, it won't necessarily be viewed as valid. I mean, you may get away with it. No one may question your capacity. But alternatively, you know, if you um, sell your house um, when you're in an elderly person's nursing home for $100,000 and it's worth a million, you, your capacity may well be questioned uh, and brought before the courts and so on. Well, and it's a central concept in the law, and it helps us to 
you know, determine you know, which of two sort of very important values to which we're probably equally committed should take priority in a particular situation. I mean, are we going to give priority to personal autonomy, self-determination, the right to make your own decisions, even ones that other people think are wrong or mistaken, the right to make mistakes? Or are we going to give priority to protecting people from you know, unnecessary harm that might occur to them or others or their property uh, as a result of them making decisions uh, that, that are insufficiently informed or by an adequate reasoning process or their failure to be able to make any decision at all. Well, in this sense, capacity is kind of a fulcrum upon which the choice between these values turns. And assessing it, you know, it's not a science. There are parameters upon which it is assessed, but I think there are strong sort of evaluative ethical, even cultural elements in it. I mean, how much understanding do we think a person needs to have in order to sell their house that is worth a million dollars? How much understanding precisely do they need to have? I mean, there's no, <laughs> there's no absolute bright line test here for this. Um, how much capacity do we think a person with intellectual learning disabilities needs to have to embark on a sexual relation with an older person who you know, has a predatory background. I mean, how, how much? <laughs> These are very imponderable and value-laden questions. And they're, not, they're not matters ultimately entirely of science or objectivity. So we have to be conscious of that, of the evaluative and ethical dimensions to them. Well, when we come then to our question of um, our context, our particular context that we're going to focus on mainly today, uh, capacity to consent to or refuse psychiatric treatment, and we immediately confront the fact that you know, there's no explicit mention of incapacity to consent to psychiatric treatment in the standards for compulsion under the Mental Health Act at present. The standards under the Mental Health Act or placing a person under compulsion don't expressly mention capacity at all. So you're no doubt thoroughly familiar with, with these standards, the classic standard definition of mental disorder, which really constitutes the, what we call sometimes the civil commitment standards, the standards for both entry into compulsory treatment and exit from it. If you fail, cease to meet these standards, you're supposed to be discharged either by the clinician or by the tribunal or court, and you need to meet them in order to be placed under compulsory treatment order. And you know, you'll be familiar with them, two legs or two limbs, as is often said, abnormal state of mind or limb, abnormal state of mind, whether continuous or intermittent, that must be characterized by one of the phenomenology on, on the list, delusions, disorders of mood, perception, volition, cognition, right? Difficult, challenging definition to apply and think about in itself. But that must be of such a degree that it poses a serious danger to the health or safety of that person or of others, or seriously diminishes their capacity for self-care. Now, there's no explicit mention here of incapacity to consent to psychiatric treatment per se in these standards. There is a reference to seriously diminished capacity to self-care. There's a reference to capacity there, a very important one. But it's not explicitly focused on the person's capacity to consent to psychiatric treatment per se. And you know, this is a major feature, therefore, of our mental health legislation and you know, it's possible therefore that you know, this could change and that's in a way what I'm here to try to discuss that possibility uh, whether it will change you know this is passing mental health legislation is politics ultimately parliament does it um, I'd be very surprised if we got a controversial mental health bill in parliament um, prior to the election this is election year the government's busy withdrawing controversial policies not sticking more on the agenda uh, and of course um, if we've got a change in government, the whole thing might change in quite a big way, particularly very strong Maori dimension to the current 
um, reform proposals, uh, a National Party Act government might not be so enamoured of that approach. So there's a lot of in, in the air, I think, here, depending on the change or, or not in the government and so forth. But, well, the key feature then is that there is no explicit mention of incapacity to consent here. Now, of course, in your practice, you know, as an ethical matter, you may be indeed concerned about people's capacity to consent, and you may incorporate that into your decision making about whether they should be placed under the Mental Health Act or continue under it, or whether even though you have the power perhaps to administer medication to a person under the Act, your decision as to whether you will, in fact, as a matter of discretion, proceed to insist that they accept medication and so on. I don't mean to suggest for a minute that as an ethical matter, people aren't incorporating capacity principles into their practice right now. They probably are and should be. But it's not there on the face of, of the law at the current time. And if you, you know, say, look at the power to treat um, conferred by the Mental Health Act here, it's conferred really in, in pretty blunt terms. Every inpatient order shall require the continued detention of the patient in hospital for the purposes of treatment and shall require the patient to accept that treatment. Okay. Every patient subject to compulsory treatment order shall be required to accept such treatment for mental disorder as the responsible clinician shall direct. And a, a compulsory treatment order includes, of course, a community treatment order. No explicit mention of lack of capacity to consent. Now, this is pretty, pretty blunt uh, sections, right? Uh, so they're clear. They have the great advantage of clarity, but they are fairly blunt. And, of course, the person may be entitled to a second opinion on the treatment in certain circumstances, on ECT and on medication beyond two months of the start of the compulsory treatment order, if they don't give their own consent, then a second opinion may be required. But if the second opinion psychiatrist approves the treatment and thinks it's in their best interests, then again, it can proceed. And there's no right to refuse. It's the right to second opinion. And so a person, even perhaps a person who does have the capacity to, to reason and think about their treatment, to a satisfactory level, you know, can be treated without their consent under the Mental Health Act. That, that is the legal position. Well, you know, the big question then is, is this a satisfactory legal position? You know, that capacity principles, in a sense, are at the heart of our law of consent to treatment in many other contexts, especially in the context of general medical care, right? But they're not at the heart of the law here concerning compulsory psychiatric treatment. Uh, and should they be? This, I think, is a set one of many central questions for the reform of the Mental Health Act. Well, are you with me so far? Fair enough? Okay. Well, what would incorporation of capacity principles into mental health law look like then? What would that be? Well, now this isn't straightforward because there are you know, many different ways that you can incorporate incapacity principles into mental health law. And, uh, once did a study of all the mental health laws of the um, major countries in Europe and also you know, Germany, the law goes state by state, Canada and the United States, the law on mental health law goes state by state, 50 mental health sets of laws in America and 12 in Canada and eight in Australia. Uh, you can read 85 sets of statutes um, if you've got the stamina <laughs> and you're mad enough. Um, and it, when you look at them, you, you know, there's innumerable different ways that capacity principles are incorporated into their laws. I mean, it can be a general test for entry into the Mental Health Act, like a third limb to the standards, mental disorder or abnormal state of mind, dangers or risks of some kind, and thirdly, incapacity to consent to psychiatric treatment. And that, in that way, it can become a general test for entry. And if you then recover your capacity subsequently, you have to be released, right? Because you no longer meet, meet the standard. So you know, that's a major way, and that's the simplest way to understand it. And that's what I'm probably, I'll go on to talk about that, that, what, that approach. But the, there are 
more subtle sort of hybrid intermediate approaches. So you could apply a capacity test only to treatment and not to detention. So you could say a person detained can be detained who has an abnormal state of mind in the defined sense and poses relevant risks in the defined sense, but they can't be treated even when they are detained if they refuse unless you find they lack the capacity to refuse, right? So you can that that's a subtlety. Detention on the basis of disorder and risk and treatment on the basis of capacity. Well, that's the case. That's the position in quite a lot of states in the United States and Ontario in Canada, and it has its own sort of advantages and disadvantages. Of course, the major disadvantages that can lead to detention without treatment. That's indefinite detention without treatment. That hasn't um, commended itself, that's reappealed really to parliaments in Australia, England or New Zealand, but it has appealed to legislatures in North America in some places. Well, a third sort of refinement might be that you apply capacity principles only to specific treatments, ECT perhaps, notably. And this is the case now in England, only ECT. So they have a rule that you can't give a person involuntary ECT who has the capacity to refuse and does refuse. This rule probably doesn't have huge practical implications because compulsory ECT is a very, you know, not a, not a common treatment and it's a pretty um, drastic thing to do. And probably people are going to be very, very seriously unwell. <laughs> We're going to be offered this possibility and so almost always they probably will be found to lack capacity because otherwise you wouldn't be offering to them at all so it may not have great practical application but nevertheless you know there's an example of a further refinement medication um, or detention under the mental health act is not governed by capacity just but ect is uh, psychosurgery could be again another one uh, that would be governed by a test well do you see there, there are various subtle intermediate positions that can be taken where certain powers under the Mental Health Act are subject to a capacity test and others are not. Well, all, all of these would be possibilities for reform of the New Zealand Mental Health Act. And you know, there are examples you know, of all of these. I could, we could take you to a statute in Saskatchewan or France or um, other parts of the world, and there would be examples of, of these approaches that could be used as precedents. Well, the simplicity I propose to talk mainly about the idea that uh, might be more appealing to our legislature, which would be that incapacity to consent to psychiatric treatment should become a sort of third general limb of the civil commitment criteria. We'll govern entry into the Mental Health Act. And if you having entered regains your capacity, then you would have to be released immediately, at least in principle, just as if you cease to be, have an abnormal state of mind or present relevant dangers or risks in theory anyway in New Zealand, you're supposed to be immediately released by your responsible clinician or by the review tribunal or court if you come in front of them. Well, what what would the standards look like? I mean, they, they would look like this, some, something like this, abnormal state of mind as defined, how we define abnormal state of mind, of course, is another huge issue, perhaps for reform of the Mental Health Act, although uh, I personally do favour there being a definition. Governments are um, often like to avoid having to construct a definition because it's so difficult and just have mental disorder or mental illness undefined. I don't favour that because I think it's so broad and so vague and doesn't really give you any purchase on anything in particular. Um, Whereas I do like our current definition in that way. It really requires us to spell out in more depth what the phenomenon are that they think the person is exhibiting, and that can be more closely examined by lawyers and, and others, and so on. But, okay, mental abnormal state of mind as defined, danger or risk as defined, and then lacks capacity to consent to psychiatric treatment or something of that kind as a third major limb of the test. Well, you know, how does this look in practice if we look not at um, you know, Saskatchewan or France, but somewhere a little closer at hand, Queensland, you know, society not so unlike our own, large numbers of Kiwis living there. 
hundreds of thousands in fact, enjoying the uh, uh, overly humid and hot climate that they have there, unlike the nice and dry, warm climate in Dunedin. Uh, we were the driest main centre over in highest sunlight hours over this recent summer. Now, I, I hesitate to draw this to the attention of people in the north because you might want to go and live there, but <laughs> nevertheless, um, you know, there it is. These are the stands in Queensland. Person has a mental illness as defined, complex definition like ours elsewhere in the Act. The person does not have capacity to consent to be treated for the illness, that is the mental illness. And because of the illness, the absence of involuntary treatment or the absence of continued involuntary treatment, they are this is likely to result in serious harm, imminent serious harm or suffering serious mental physical deterioration. Okay. Mental disorder, incapacity, dangers and risks. There it is. This is the law in Queensland right now. It's not a big leap to think that this could be the law in New Zealand, uh, especially when also the Substance Abuse Compulsory Assessment and Treatment Act, the SAC Act, has taken the same approach, has an incapacity to consent to treatment for substance abuse alongside the severe substance abuse and the risks in that act. And that's passed here in 2017, and that's, I think, a pretty strong point, though, as to therefore where things are going in New Zealand. Um, but it's in the lap of the political gods. Well, what does you know capacity to consent to treatment mean, then, in the Mental Health Act? The Queensland Act then goes on to define this in, in fairly orthodox terms person has the capacity to consent to be treated for mental illness if they're capable of understanding in general terms, they have an illness, okay, or symptoms of an illness that affects their mental health and well-being. So you know, complete denial of illness could be viewed as incapacity, right? They, we would say they didn't understand they had an illness or they didn't have the symptoms of an illness. So denial of illness can be viewed as incapacity. They don't understand the nature and purpose of the treatment, and they don't understand the benefits and risks of the treatments and alternatives to the treatment, which would include not having the treatment. So they don't necessarily understand what the consequences of not having the treatment might be, um, relapse perhaps, deterioration, not perhaps reaching your cry level of functioning again, and so on. They might not have sufficient understanding of that, um, or communicating it. They have to be capable of communicating the decision in some way. So traditional approach, fairly, but specifically mention this idea that you have to understand you have an illness, perhaps making it somewhat clearer than some general capacity tests do that probably lack of insight is going to be considered severe lack of insight. It's going to be considered a form of incapacity. Well, you know, if this was the law, then... Obviously, it would require some ongoing capacity assessment process. It would require it at the start uh, when you're considering putting a person under the Mental Health Act, but it would also be required you know, on an ongoing basis, on a continuing basis, as well as assessing the abnormal state of mind and the risks. The third major area of ongoing assessment. And well, this, I think, approach probably also would preclude making assumptions too readily that simply because a person does have an abnormal state of mind, then they necessarily lack capacity to consent. I mean, by having a separate indication that incapacity to consent must be separately considered, it's pretty clearly making the point that one should not be assuming simply because a person exhibit certain, um, you know, it's considered a certain diagnosis or certain phenomenology that they necessarily lack capacity to consent. So it's, it's a strong sort of warning against making over really assumptions of that kind. Well, those would be some of the immediate legal implications. Well, now can we sort of try and then and go more deeply into this, explore more? What, possibilities might be. Obviously, it would have implications for, for nursing work. Uh, you would be part of that capacity assessment process. And 
there would be your relations with other health professionals, psychologists, and responsible clinicians within multidisciplinary teams as to what your relevant roles were. The dynamics of interdisciplinary teams would be part of this question. How much will this be a nursing question? Is this only going to be a psychiatric question? What are your observations and interactions with the person, which may be more extensive long term than those of the clinician, and so on? Training, obviously, more training, capacity assessment, more input. All of those matters. Well, these then are the sort of questions. If we can just sum up then for a moment, I'll sort of pause and reflect where we've got to. <laughs> Um, you know, what are the ideas that point towards the inclusion of capacity principles in the Mental Health Act? And what would be the potential advantages, drawbacks, implications for mental health professionals, their clients, or dynamics within multidisciplinary teams? You know, and ultimately, we face the sort of big question, would the potential advantage of this outweigh the disadvantages? Advantages outweigh the drawbacks? I mean, even if there are disadvantages, probably are. You know, there's also benefits. And we're left with a very imponderable equation at the end, as always. Would these disadvantages, even if we do identify them, agree that there would be some, are they nevertheless outweighed by the advantages, ultimately? That's a big question. Well, this is what I'm, I'm wanting us to think about. And I don't pretend for a moment this is easy. <laughs> That's clearly not. Well, any thoughts, discussions so far? Are you, are we going okay? Any, uh, I have a bit more to cover. Uh, any comments? Do you think about moving on? Anything? So this is particularly so that the people on Zoom can get a question. Otherwise, I can continue for a, a little longer. Anything at all? Comments? Insults? Anything? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, the capacities. Um, so, I mean, because I work at the inpatient unit and I just feel that the new mental health act is going to, I've, I've done both actually, I've worked in mental health for 30 years, so I've done community, I've done crisis work, and now I'm back at inpatient. I just feel that some of this is going to add a lot more risk to us as inpatient nurses, you know. A lot of our clients come in now with drug-induced psychosis, you know, I mean. Yes. How is that going to work? As an, I just feel that we've been set up to, for violence towards us, basically. Um, well, that, uh, that's certainly uh, a very significant concern, and I, I certainly plan to turn my attention more to that in a, in a few months, yeah. Um, if the patients they're dealing with are, are acutely unwell, then the, the conclusion might be quite readily reached that they do lack capacity. And you would then be in the same position as you are now. You would be authorised probably to proceed with the treatment without consent. So uh, there might be more work, you know, you might be more process, yes, to go through. Well, it's kind of a third assessment in a sense. But it might not be difficult to reach the conclusion that someone who's acutely psychotic lacks the capacity of consent right now to their, their treatment. So it might not have such huge implications in that situation. Um, I think actually it might, the implications might be larger in the community because people who are under community treatment orders, I mean, by definition, they're considered well enough to be in the community, although I, I know they can be, still be very unwell. Um, but people under long-term community treatment orders haven't been back in hospital in a year or something. You know, they, they're perhaps more likely to be found to have capacity to consent to treatment. And so it might, it might have more implications for the long-term use of community treatment orders, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, perhaps. Maybe people are kept on community treatment orders too long now. Um, however, indefinite community treatment orders are going to be abolished later this year, and they're all going to become you know, periodic, uh, have a defined limit. Uh, I think that your concern about violence is going to be at the forefront of uh, parliaments thinking about this. I think so. What what comes up from the Ministry of Health was coming through the current law of the process. The Ministry of Health 
isn't necessarily going to appeal to parliamentarian, <laughs> parliamentarians you know, who are very concerned about what their constituents think, what families, <laughs> what families think, what mental health nurses and clinicians think, and so on. So it's going to be very interesting to see what, what happens when it hits, it hits Parliament. And the ones that are on the definite um, community treatment orders, you'll find that a lot of those patients, a lot of those clients only take their medication because they're on order. Once they come off the community treatment order, if they stop taking their medications, they end up back in hospital because they get unwell. Yes. Uh, that, and that will be of great concern to their families. Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, yes, that, that's the other potential, one other major potential downside. Of because a lot of our clients, they've been their bridges with their families, as it is at the beginning of their mental health. Yes. Um, episode. But if they're on a community treatment order and they're taking their medication, they won't necessarily be in those bridges. But I mean, if they're going to stop, if they're going to take the community, the indefinite community treatment order away, and the patients keep becoming revolving with patients, they're certainly going to build their bridges with their family. I've seen Yes, oh, I, I, I understand your objection. It's one of the major objections that can be made to, to this. Uh, well, you've made two of the major ones right away. The potential for greater violence and the potential for people with um, not to get sustained treatment to come on on the mental health act off again on again off again as uh, capacity fluctuates over time and so on and that is another major objection to the situation so well why what, don't what, what, I, I try and just come a bit more systematically to, to those to those yeah, all you do. Okay, so this is a uh, come through from someone on Zoom. It says, um, we imply a person has capacity if they use or don't use the appeals process, but they do have their mental health court uh, with a free lawyer to present their cons uh, consent or not. Um, is that fine? Sorry, did you say that again? <laughs> Yeah, it says we imply a person has the uh, has capacity if they use or don't use the appeals process. Um, I'm assuming in uh, mental health uh, court tribunals, um, but they do have the mental health court with a free lawyer to present their consent or not. So we're sort of implying that they have capacity. I think what they're saying is to be implying that they have capacity when they use it, but we're also using the lawyer who's sort of like using as their formal consent. I think that's what it's. Well. I don't think we would assume that a person has the capacity to, to consent or refuse psychiatric treatment simply because they invoke the appeal process. Uh, and this goes back in a way to the, my point at the beginning about there being multiple capacity tests in the law for multiple different purposes, and it depends on the, the particular task that you're engaged in. Uh, as to the kind of skills or the folks that you need. So you know, to say that a person has the capacity to consent or to reason about the psychiatric treatment uh, at a minimally adequate level to meet the relevant legal test simply because they've engaged in an appeal process, you know, it doesn't follow that they, that they do. It follows that they're concerned about being in the hospital and they want to engage the appeal process, <laughs> which, is, which is not the same thing at all. So um, these things can be distinguished. I don't think we can you know, reason from one to the other. Um, they might still have a lawyer, though, it's, it's true, who would be there to contest their capacity at the hearing, and the lawyers would be able to contest this. They'd be able to contest the abnormal state of mind criteria, the risk criteria, and the incapacity criteria. All, all of the legal criteria could be contested by, by lawyers. Um, there are interesting questions about people's capacity to instruct lawyers mm -hmm. in this situation. And you know, as you know, mental health lawyers frequently face this issue. Should they follow their client's instructions? Uh, are they competent instructions? Uh, even if they're not, should they follow them in order to give them a hearing or sort of test the clinician's opinions and so forth? So there are capacity questions in relations between clients and their lawyers as well. Uh, and there are questions, I don't know, we can make capacity to invoke the appeal process. Um, I don't think the law will be very attracted to that idea. 
Because if you took that view and said persons lack the capacity to invoke the appeal process, they would be denied the, the appeal process. And that would be thwarting the whole you know, due process for a person who may be detained and is entitled to a hearing on a matter of their liberty and so on. Well, um, that's how I would suggest that. I don't think we would assume persons have capacity just because they invoke any particular process. We have one more question on Zoom, which I'll just uh, read it before we proceed. The question is, is the new Mental Health Act in play or is it still going through Parliament? And when is it likely to start impacting on our practice? Um, effectively, the question is, what is the position with the review of the Mental Health Act? I mean, my understanding is that the Mental Health Act review is currently sort of in the Ministry of Health. It's going through various consultation processes. There have been experts sort of committees formed and documents formulated. And consultation public sort of issue papers have gone out and people have made submissions and they're being uh, thought about within the Ministry of Health. And the next step that the legislation might take, I mean, it might then, we might then expect that there would be a kind of a draft bill that might be circulated for consultation. It depends. How legislation goes through Parliament you know, varies. It's up to the government to decide. Sometimes they'll publish an entire draft bill before it goes into Parliament. Uh, sort of a, so you can have another round of consultations on that, where we can really look at the actual detailed provisions which is in some ways the most interesting time because the wording, the powers and the criteria and so on you know, really do matter. So at that point, we might make further submissions. Um, and then there would be a bill introduced to, to Parliament. Um, alternatively, that draft bill step might be skipped. It might, might go straight to the introduction of a bill into Parliament. It would probably be introduced by the Minister of Health. Um, I would be surprised if it was introduced before the election just because I don't think it's likely to be um, straightforward <laughs> at all for the various reasons that the, the, the woman just raised, questions about violence and um, people uh, relapsing when they go off their compulsory treatment orders and, and concerns of families and constituents who are in the air of MPs, you know, after all. So I don't expect it to go into the... I may be wrong. The government may wish to be able to, to be seen to be doing something about mental health. Uh, I mean, we did have this big inquiry that Ron Patterson and others conducted a, a few years ago uh, that was calling for very far-reaching changes in the field of mental health, and the government may be wishing to see to be seen to respond in a more comprehensive way. Um, but I, I'd be surprised. So um, what is the progress? I think it's uncertain, in short. Passing legislation is always political. It's politicians who pass legislation, they determine the pace of the program. So uh, I don't expect it to be enacted you know, anytime soon. And even if it was, you know, maybe sort of later this year or next year, I, don't, I wouldn't expect it to come into force immediately either, you know, because being, being enacted is one thing and coming into force is another. Uh, as we see with these um, abolition of indefinite community orders. I mean, they were that, that legislation was passed a couple of years ago and still hasn't come into force yet, right? And this is common. You have a period where people sort of digest it and undergo training and institutions get ready and um, who knows, new kinds of officials get appointed. Uh, logos are designed at great expense for new institutions. Uh, car doors, uh, signs on car doors are repainted and uh, other things. Uh, so there, there will be a, you know, a time lapse, I would think, especially if it's going to be significant changes. So I, I would think some some years, and by then I will have retired and <laughs> um, hoping my golf handicap will be going down. Uh, I'll be able to play a bit more. Well, long answer, but it's, it's in the lap of the politicians. It's the short answer. Well, um, I won't go on for too much longer, but let me, I'll just skip ahead a bit. Um, and if we just come back to our, our question here about you know, what the implications of adding a an incapacity test might be, the principal implication, of course, is that people who meet the capacity test and refuse treatment could either not be put under the Mental Health Act or if they were under it have to be released 
Well, if the capacity test applied to a specific form of treatment like ECT, then they wouldn't be able to be given it lawfully. And there would be clearly be implications for the assessment process in general, for training, for workloads, and relations between different people in interdisciplinary teams as to who had the primary sort of say and who, whose business it was really to assess capacity and how nursing insights and observations of dealings with patients will be fed into that capacity assessment process. But you know, in addition, I think you know, there are a number of possible implications for uses of the Mental Health Act in general. And a couple have been immediately identified. Let me just sort of work through a few of these and then try to sort of say what I think the whole equation is and then just open things generally for discussion. I mean, the first is, I think, the one that you immediately mentioned, Madam, that it might prevent the sustained psychiatric treatment of those with, with fluctuating conditions or whose capacity is restored you know, via involuntary treatment and will uh, be lost again or become unwell again if they cease to be under the Mental Health Act and drop out of treatment. So you know, fluctuating disorders of various forms, mood disorders, for instance, such persons might not receive sustained psychiatric treatment. And of course, the fact that they might be have to be released from the Act if they regain their capacity and refuse uh, doesn't mean they can't be put under the Act again. The Act can, of course, be reinstituted if they come to meet the criteria again, as is the case now with the mental disorder and risk criteria. But nevertheless, you know, I understand that requires, uh, has to be triggered putting people back under the Act, it requires more assessment, more effort, and there may be very unfortunate events occur in the intermediate period when they're not under the Act. So, you know, this is indeed, you know, if we can put this, this is one possible major objection to the change. And I'm sure that this will be urged on parliamentarians by members of the mental health professions and families. Uh, a second objection is that you know, the second one you immediately made, Madam, that it might prevent the treatment of those who are, who are considered to be mentally disordered in the relevant sense and dangerous or risky in the relevant sense um, or suicidal, but who retain the capacity to consent. And you know, I'd be very interested in your thoughts about that, whether there are certain you know, categories of patients, certain people who you think are particularly likely to be affected in this way. You, know, you would say that they were mentally disordered and risky under the current criteria, but you might also say they have the capacity to consent. You know, who, who are these people? This is people the most likely perhaps to sort of no longer be under the Mental Health Act if the criteria changed. Who are they? Could we identify who they're likely to be? I mean, it might be, I don't know, people with certain kinds of mood disorders, so, you know, depression, for instance, you know, who might well be able to reason you know, very, pretty well about their, their treatment, but they're still very severely depressed and possibly, uh, you know, at risk of suicide. Um, that would be one matter. Um, so I'm just thinking with that, that discussion is um, there's kind of, I think, a potentially ethical issue coming up, you know, between the people's, um, right now under the end of life law to have an assisted or a suicide at the end of life as opposed to people who um, choose they're not at that stage where they have a debilitating disease but have those suicidal thoughts whereas it's still a crime that we can stop people from committing suicide in one set of laws but under another set of laws, we're able to assist people to potentially do the same thing. Yes, um, that's right. It brings into stark relief the uh, legal position regarding psychiatric treatment on the one hand and people in another position on the other. I mean, we allow people who have the capacity uh, but who are suffering from, say, terminal cancer to um, agree to end their lives or have their lives ended in, in this way by a physician. And so we do permit people who have the capacity in effect to commit suicide. Yes, we do. And yet we're not necessarily allowing this to people who are said to be mentally disordered in the relevant sense. 
Okay, so it does bring it into into stark relief. Um, and so, you know, the question is: Is this a form of discrimination? Is it a form of illegitimate discrimination against people on the grounds of mental disability that we deny them, in a sense, this right to commit suicide if they have the capacity to think about it in the right way? And is it discrimination in the law itself? In the legal standards, right? If so, should we introduce the capacity criteria into the legal standards in order to remove the discrimination? Of course, some people oppose the use of capacity standards altogether and don't want to have any kind of capacity tests in the law and want to recognize sort of universal legal capacity that all persons have, have capacity. Um, I understand the motivations behind that. I mean, in the past, Compulsory psychiatric patients have, in some situations, been sort of deemed to lack a whole range of, of capacities. Uh, when I started in this game, if you were committed under the Mental Health Act, you automatically lost control of your property, for instance. Your property was handed over to the administration of the public trustee, and you automatically lost your driving license. And you probably were banned from serving on a jury, being a company director, being an MP, um, and a whole lot of other things. There's a whole basket of disabilities immediately, legal disabilities immediately imposed upon you by being a compulsory patient. You know? And so you know, this history of um, deeming people who perhaps were perfectly competent to, say, be an MP <laughs> um, or <laughs> manage their measurable benefit <laughs> payments, um, they uh, they lost these abilities. So you know, they're almost treated as non-persons in a sense. You know, things that all adults think are their entitlements to drive a car, manage your, your money and so forth. We're, we're denied them. So you know, I understand why people favour this idea of universal legal capacity. Though I, I don't really accept it pushed to its limits. I, I think that we must recognise there are some people who, who really do lack capacity and need protection. Uh, people who are unconscious, for instance, immediately spring to mind. So you have to have, you know, that I don't get an adequate theory of the unconscious person out of people who favor universal legal capacity. Well, um, coming back then to, uh, you know, this, uh, I mean, as you pointed out, Madam, I think this is going to be a primary concern with the change that people who are dangerous, I don't know, perhaps some people with severe personality disorders or mood disorders or delusional disorders uh, might be you know, considered to have, have capacity, certainly after a certain period of treatment, and yet they might still be considered dangerous. Um, and they might then end up being dealt with by the criminal law instead, right? So this is the other side of the equation. What is going to happen? With these persons when they engage in interpersonal violence. Um, well, they might, although you would be able to say, well, it was Parliament that changed the laws and isn't permitting me doing my job, although that might you know, not reach the front page of the <laughs> Dominion. If you determine somebody has capacity to make their own decisions about their treatment, they have a history when they're unwell of being particularly violent and appearing in front of the courts. We, if if I drink and drive, yes. <laughs> then I, I have to suffer the consequence. If I know I have a, a mental disorder that causes me to become unduly violent and risky and I stop my medication, and it's a capacity assessment, and at the time that I stop it and for the next number of weeks, I have the capacity not to take it. Then when I become unwell and go on to do something, who, who becomes responsible? <laughs> uh, well, um, you do. Uh, <laughs> for stopping it. I mean, that's the other side of the equation. I mean, you're, in a way, we might say, that's right. I mean, the people... Um, you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing, is in, in short? I mean, you, you can make a case either way. You can make the case that really some people who, um, you know, that perhaps they do have a certain form of mental disorder and they are violent sometimes and have a history of violence, 
but if they have the capacity to make this kind of decision when they're well, then they should be entitled to make it, but they have to take the consequences, right? They have to take the consequences. And if they end up imprisoned, well, that's the consequence. And this is sort of the, whatever, the dignity of risk, as we say, right? The right to make mistakes. On the other hand, if later you then try to claim that uh, you should not be found responsible because <laughs> you're mental dis disordered, I mean, there will, will, there will be a plausibility to that too, because maybe you you will be mentally disordered at the time, right? Even though even though it's you who decided not to take the medication, right? <laughs> um, but you know, prison staff, okay, let's make clear the prison staff in the prisons are you know here implicated in this change, therefore, and the police. How are they going to deal with these situations? Are we going to have more people with serious mental illness in prison? Already the rates are, you know, very high. Something like 10% of prisoners have a serious diagnosis of serious mental illness. And when you have 6,000, 7,000 prisoners, that's 700 people in New Zealand prison with serious mental illness today. So is it going to get worse? Um, how's it going to, how people are going to be dealt with in prison? You can say, well, they can be transferred to the hospital if they've come very unwell in prison, but we all know that's very difficult. You know, it's virtually impossible to get a transfer from hospital to prison. So they end up getting dealt with in prison. And there is no power to treat people compulsorily with medication in prison, right? That's, there's no power to do that. But maybe in future we would get, um, therefore, pressure to introduce such a power. You know, now we would have compulsory medication in prison. Sir? So uh, the, this is one that always amazes me how a prisoner in the prison with I guess, some responsibility on corrections, and yet if they choose to refuse their medication, that's okay until it gets to a point where they're starting to to face, you know, to ruin the building, assault staff, etc. Then they get pushed out of the prison into the forensic, and, uh, you know, so we kind of have a de facto, well, I don't want to take my meds, so, that, you know, they, they're allowed to not take their meds, which just seems insane and high risk to the correction staff. But I mean, I'm not expecting you to give me an answer, I think, but that is kind of what we could end up with in the outside until they reach the threshold and then they get assessed and, and then what happens, I guess, as you say, the risks on them, they go to prison and the whole thing continues. Well, the risk is on them, but it's also uh, on other people who are going to be harmed by their conduct, and especially their family members and who uh, are closer, most likely to be harmed, mm. and and the prison staff as well. I mean, dealing with prison staff. There are, there, I think, there are good reasons why compulsory medication is not authorised in prison. I mean, prisoners... Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think it, it really it goes to the idea... You know, Prisoners are in a very vulnerable situation in a whole range of ways, of course. And I think the main concern is that, that it might be used overly as sort of a management tool. You know, you know, you know what we see in the UK that prisoners are over medicated um, to keep them quiet. Well, so I think the New Zealand way of doing things is much better. Well, it's fine for them to leave the prison. I mean, it's a different approach to Yes, I think you know the danger is that people will be over medicated, tranquilized, and effect imprisoned for management purposes, to, for, because the staff will be put, you know, pressure on them. They will be less at risk, and so on, and you know, we end up with large numbers of prisoners medicated, medicated, and that I think you know it's a real risk. So that's the reason why. On the other hand, the the, the rule in this area, you know. It was enacted, it's always been this way, but I mean, in the past, it was much more possible to get transfers from prison to hospital than it is today. It seems to have become almost impossible. 40 years ago, it was, there was a route and people seriously on well would go to the hospital. I think that's a, a particular challenge is our lack of um, capacity, our lack of resources within our um, health system around providing beds in hospitals and forensic units um, and a raft of issues around um, staffing, lack of resources, et cetera, um, to manage people that potentially should be in hospitals rather than in prisons. And Katie works in a prison. You've got an example from your area. Yeah. Um, so frequently we have people come into um, our prison who basically should have 
they've been assessed, they've come into prison, they have drug-induced psychosis, or we have people with severe and enduring mental illness. And as uh, the gentleman over there said, they've stopped their medication, they go, it's my right to stop. They end up being incredibly unwell in prison for an incredibly long time because we do not have the beds to admit them to. And it just, it, and it, we, um, we're talking about not being able to medicate in prison, but in prison, the corrections, security will always take precedence over therapy. So it's they will over medicate. Yeah, I'll constantly go on to site now. Can you not just give them something to stop them doing this? No, not really. <laughs> so, and it's a constant. And this capacity uh, makes me concerned that this is going to increase. Well, yeah, that, that, this is a major concern, and um, you know, this is the next one that I was had on my my list. Um, it can lead to detention without treatment, right? And I mean that's what you're talking about in a way in the prison. But the question is if you introduce a rule where people could be detained to contain the risk under the Mental Health Act, mental disorder and risk criteria could permit detention. But then the treatment was governed by the incapacity rules. Then you end up now with detention without treatment in the hospital as well. And there's the prospect of sort of greater use of seclusion and restraints in the hospital and more violence against uh, staff or, or more heavy-handed security measures being employed. Now, how, how real this sort of spectre of greater restraint and seclusion and violence in hospitals is, I don't know. I mean, this was all very much the argument in the North American jurisdictions when they moved down this route. That there'll be much more violence and restraint. And I think perhaps in some individual cases, there will be some individuals who will absolutely refuse the treatment and say, well, I'd rather be detained or something of that kind. But in fact, when studies are done of this, it turns out that, of course, when people are told, we're going to keep detaining you <laughs> unless you accept the treatment <laughs> and get better, then overwhelmingly they actually do accept the treatment. And the number of people who refuse treatment in this situation, it turns out to be quite small. Of course, they're in a very coercive environment when they accept the treatment. I mean, whether this is re really consent, I mean, probably not, you know, in a sense, it's coerced consent. But nevertheless, it doesn't turn out perhaps to be in practice such a, such a grave a danger as, as might initially appear, because people threatened with indefinite detention will accept treatment. But, you know, well, do we want to go down that path? I mean, is that, is that a route we want to go down? And you know, finally, just sort of wrap things up, because uh, the, you know, the concern about community treatment orders, it's, it's, in a way, it's a bit like the concern about people with fluctuating mental disorders getting too readily to charge from the Mental Health Act. And I think people on community treatment orders probably are especially implicated here because they're you know, in the community, they're on them for much longer periods of time and probably they're likely to be you know, more well, presumably, than people who are in hospital, right? And so they're more likely to be found to have capacity. And so people, this might lead to earlier discharge of people from mental health orders, uh, community treatment orders. You know, some people will think this is a good thing. Some people will think people kept too long on community treatment was now it's too much defense of medical practice people are too concerned about having their name in the newspaper and not concerned enough about the liberties of the patient you know so you know this too could be viewed as either way it's a good thing or a bad thing uh depending on how you look at it well so let me just try to sum up then for a couple of months um what are some of the advantages of including capacity principles in the Mental Health, Health Act. I mean, we would end up applying equivalent legal principles to the treatment of mental and physical illness, right? Capacity principles apply to treatment for general medical conditions, and you can refuse treatment even if you were going to die. You know, you can refuse amputation of your leg, gangrenous leg, if you have capacity, or you can choose um, medical assisted dying. And you can refuse chemotherapy for invasive cancer and die. So the consequences can be very grave of refusing treatment, general medical treatment. And they're not just consequences for you necessarily, they can are consequences for others as well. Your family, your spouse, your children. If you refuse chemotherapy and die and you have two children, you know, them too. They too suffer the consequences, right? Not just you. Well, we apply those principles to general medical care. Why not apply them to all? Are we applying less favorable legal standards to psychiatric treatment? Shouldn't we acknowledge that mental disorder isn't always 
associated with incapacity. And we also would be acknowledging that people with mental disorders are already assessed for capacity in many other legal contexts, right? Fitness to stand trial, make a will, marry, enter a contract, drive. Capacity assessment of people with mental disorders is going on all the time, everywhere across the legal system. Uh, and it hasn't proven to be impossible, even if very difficult. Well, on the other hand, you know, there's all of those difficulties that we have discussed about people fluctuating disorders, possibility of more violence, suicide, possibility of criminalization, deteriorating situation in the prisons, maybe detention without treatment. Okay, that's the other side. We're speculating, you know, to the extent to which these things will really happen. You know, will they really? Maybe people put more energy into getting people to consent to treatment. <laughs> Actually getting them to consent. Well, the final equations, even if these objections, they do carry weight, some of them weight, are they so great that they would outweigh the advantages of equal treatment in the law and recognising that some people who do suffer from mental distress and might meet the criteria of mental disorder and danger, nevertheless, do still retain the capacity to reason about their treatment to a level that should be recognised. Well, it isn't easy, is it? <laughs> no. And in the end, politicians will make the decision. There's time for are there time for more questions, John? Oh well, okay. I mean, I think yeah, sure. I think I think, I think I've got I think you questions in the room. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of questions myself. Uh, first of all, you mentioned uh, as one of the possible objections uh, consideration of who would be excluded from coverage of compulsion if the criteria changed with the addition of a third limb being capacity. And you gave the example of yeah. depressed people. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very valid example. Uh, often people understand that they're depressed mm -hmm. and they and they may choose not to take treatment and they understand the consequences of that. So that I think that is a, a, a valid example. And another example, I think, could be people with eating disorders. Yes, I think um, that's right. People with anorexia nervosa or other eating disorders. That's yeah, right. Which, of course, is a, is a diagnosis with a high lethality um, outcome. It is. Yeah. It's also a controversial use of the Mental Health Act in some cases because of the question of its utility or futility is also often an issue. Indeed. Um, look, I just had a, my, my second question was about the ways in which capacity might be incorporated into future mental health law. Um, one reading of Heaar Oranga, which is the report of the um, inquiry, yes. um, might suggest if you're picking up on, if you're looking for hints, that instead of being included as a third limb, um, it would be included instead as a replacement of the second limb. Do you have any comments on that? Um, is there, instead of being a third limb, it would be included as a replacement of the second limb. Um, so, yes, I understand what you're saying. It would, it would be then equivalent to the position under what I call general medical law, law of general medical treatment. You'd have to decide the person um, suffering from a mental disorder of some kind and lack capacity to make the decision. And then they could be treated uh, for psychiatric disorder, regardless of, of risk, provided presumably it was sort of the less restrictive approach and in their best interests or something of that kind, and consistent perhaps with their own prior sort of expressions of values and so forth. Yes, well, that would be that would be another another possibility. Although you know, if this is going to be lead to detention of the person, people might question whether that would be appropriate. Uh, we don't generally detain people who are undergoing general medical care, especially not in forensic and secure facilities. So should we say that people should be able to be detained who aren't posing uh, serious risks? Because you're suggesting abolishing the serious risk criteria. I'm not well, suggesting it. I'm just saying that you know, um, there, there was some would be the implication. reading between the lines. You could see it that way in, in yeah. the recommendations of the report. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I certainly would have hesitations about that in terms of, of detention. And I know most lawyers would too. It's grounds for treatment and detention. I mean, I think there's a, a thrust, uh, if you like, certainly in some of the submissions to the inquiry uh, to, to remove risk 
and, and in fact, also in the consultation paper, yeah. the public consultation paper on repeal and replacement that came out from the from the ministry, right. it did talk about moving away from a risk based criteria for compulsory assessment or detention. Right, I can see that. On, yeah. on the other hand, I think we would still need standards for deciding when people ought to be detained. Right. Uh, and we need legal stands for that. Absolutely, we do. Um, I'm thinking of the, you know, the position of the elderly in New Zealand. I mean, there are many elderly people detained and secured dementia units, right, who are not under the Mental Health Act. Lots, thousands. And they are detained under the kind of standards that you're talking about. You know, they're suffering from dementia and they lack the capacity to decide where they should live. Um, or what would be safe living circumstances for them. And they are uh, in the secure dementia unit, maybe under the Triple PR Act or a decision of a welfare guardian or enduring attorney, or maybe nothing at all, really, you know, just under standards of necessity under what we call the old common law. And in effect, you'd be suggesting that that should, should become the general, general situation right across the board. Um, on the other hand, I, I wouldn't favour that myself, um, because I and many others don't necessarily favour the lack of standards used for the detention of the elderly <laughs> either. We don't think that elderly people should be detained without any proper standards applying to their detention. That should be regulated probably a bit more seriously than it is as well. Um, so I, I think we should retain the standards governing detention, especially in secure environments, uh, and not abandon risk criteria for that purpose. This remains relevant to detention. Yeah. Um, we've just had one come through on Zoom. It said, so by including capacity assessment, are you meaning that restraint and seclusion could increase and not actually decrease? Uh, well, I think that, that, that's a possibility. Yes, it's a sort of spectrum of that. If, if people can be detained, but they can't be medicated, then it may be that seclusion and restraint would then be used more frequently. So it would be contrary to that other sort of policy imperative that we should be reducing seclusion. Yes. So they would be loggerheads, arguably, those two, those two policies. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the discussion, which has been very interesting and edifying. Um, I don't mean to suggest any of this is at all easy. And I don't envy you the possibility of implementing the new Mental Health Act, but then I don't envy you the, the prospect of uh, implementing the current Mental Health Act <laughs> either. It has its own, it has its own difficulties. All right. Well, many thanks for all of the discussion. John, I just have another comment before you actually finish wrapping up. Is that? Um, the whole issue around capacity and that we've seen that now with the um, Substance Abuse Compulsory Assessment and Treatment Act, which is a pretty much act that is based on capacity, it has, um, I guess, made it very difficult sometimes to um, treat people um, and people's capacity um, and their ability to make decisions um, is very erratic and that it fluctuates so that you might have capacity today and then tomorrow you might not have capacity depending on maybe a substance use or something. And particularly within our mental health um, and addictions sphere of nursing, um, we have many people with dual diagnosis. So a lot of our mental health clients are also substance users, which may um, challenge their capacity in some instances. And it makes our our life's very difficult in, in trying to um, work with some of these people. I'm just wondering if you've got any comments you could make around that. Well, not much other than to say that, you know, you identify the classic case of fluctuating capacity. Yes, you do. And, I'm, um, and when a person's sober, they may have capacity, and when they're acutely intoxicated, they may not. And you're right, that is always a difficulty in assessing people under the SACAD Act, perhaps, or, um, and it was under the Alcoholism and Drug Addiction Act, perhaps, too. Uh, the point you're making about the intersection between the substance use and the Mental Health Act, um, a person who has a dual diagnosis may have a rapidly fluctuating capacity, 
That's a very interesting additional point. Yes, that's another reason why people may have fluctuating capacity and another difficulty that may arise with uh, the obligation to release a person immediately from the Mental Health Act who retain or gains capacity and refuses. Um, yes, that's an added twist. Thank you. Um, and just, I do have another one thing too. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I guess um, as a group of, of nurses um, and people um, that potentially have less political influence, which might kind of segue nicely into Teresa's speech, but um, it seems often that the voices of particular groups of society seem to get heard by the people making the policy. And, um, you know, often that... Um, us as clinicians, we feel that our voice is actually lost in the whole process of um, making submissions and and what people might take on board as um, you know valid valid reasons or valid um, expressions and comments. And I think we've seen that quite a lot at the moment between this whole seclusion reduction um, policy. And whilst we don't advocate for seclusion. We know that there is um, seems to be like a quite a disconnect between people making the policies and clinicians on the floor who have to work in the environment. So um, I don't know if you've got any comments about that either. Uh, well, that's interesting. And in going into a law reform process as we are, um, obviously our next talk is going to be on this in this area. I look forward to it. Um, I think you need to be organised. You've got to be organised and you've got to make submissions. Um, and it's expensive and time consuming to do that. But you should, and you shouldn't expect that, say, the College of Psychiatrists will certainly be making submissions that their interests and history are the same as yours. Or you know, they, they may, they'll overlap probably, but they won't be the same. So you need to have make your own submissions. Um, the seclusion policy is an interesting one. The seclusion change in seclusion policy have been driven more on a sort of administrative level through the ministry and health boards and so on, rather than by parliament. There have been significant changes in legislation in that area. So when it comes to major legislative change, on the other hand, parliament's got to make the change. And the question of whether parliament listens to the same groups that the Ministry of Health listens to um, is an interesting one. I don't think they necessarily do because you know parliamentarians are much more concerned about the views of the general public and their constituents, right? The voters, who, rather than perhaps you know, other groups. So, what the Ministry of Health is hearing, and what Parliament are hearing, may not turn out to be the same thing, and, and that will be absolutely critical in the law reform process through Parliament. Yeah. All right. Well, many thanks. John, um, just thank you so much for um, coming to talk to us today. I think it's a, a really, really interesting topic. It's a, it's a whole can of worms, I think, for mental health nursing at the moment, and um, certainly a lot of food for thought and a lot of, um, I think, work to do for us as, as we go forward for mental health nursing around what that might look like for us in the future. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so do you want to take two minutes just to stand up and have a stretch and then um, we'll have um, Teresa in two minutes.
And then stop sharing and ratio. You share. Yeah, no, no, I'm just fine. Oh, well, I'm not on feeling extremely anxious after them. Yeah. I don't usually, I don't actually, but after, I suppose, just coming out of that, you know, kind of academic <laughs> presentation. Anyway, that'll be all right. That'll be all right. That's <laughs> right. Hey, <laughs> Dee. I've got no shows. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, that was an absolutely interesting um, topic that Professor Dawson and um, talked about and that we contributed to. So um, really, really, really interesting. Um, and please, this is going to be extremely interesting as well. Although on a different note, and um, I'd like to introduce Teresa to you. Teresa O'Connor is a former nurse, um, has worked in the health system and then um, went on a pathway to choose journalism and worked as the um, editor of Kaitiaki in NZNO's magazine for many, many years. Um, uh, Teresa is now retired and enjoying the good life. So, um, yeah, has a, has a really um, um, interesting topic around, um, I guess, the political voice of nursing and what that might mean for mental health nursing in the future. So thank you so much, Teresa, for agreeing to come today. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and you know, I started off with thank you for inviting me, but I'm not feeling very grateful right now. Um, following on from the you know, extremely interesting, insightful presentation we've just had from a true academic, and now you're just getting a retired hat. So, you know, I, I need to give you that context. Um, uh, and I, so I do feel utterly fraudulent, um, as I'm neither a specialist mental health nurse or any kind of nurse, for that matter, who's practiced recently. But um, And when I originally wrote this, I said I recently retired from Katiaki Nursing New Zealand, but in fact it's close to two years um, now. Um, and I, But I was there for a long, long time, and I guess I suppose anything gives me a shred of credibility to be here today is is that I have observed, reported on, commented on, ruminated about, marveled at, been astounded by, infuriated by, very frustrated by, and profoundly grateful for nurses and the nursing profession over that time. Um, so to introduce myself, called Teresa O'Connor Aho, I am a mother, daughter, sister, wife, friend, ex-colleague, I was raised on a dairy farm outside Nelson, a far cry from the industrialised dairying of today. And I trained as a journalist on leaving school. And after two years at university, I realised lawyering was not for me. Um, I then got a job as a psychiatric assistant at the sprawling Nafatu institution in Nelson um, and saved money to venture overseas in 77. It was at Nafatu that the seed of pursuing a nursing career was sown. I admired the chutzpah of many of my colleagues. I enjoyed their humour, their perspectives on life, and for the most part, how they cared for patients. But I was ignorant of the history of such institutions and of many of the practices that were carried out within them. After six years overseas, for the most part working as a journalist in Ireland, I returned to Aotearoa broke and in need of work. So I returned to what I knew, newspaper journalism in Whangarei, Nelson and Wellington. But the idea of nursing had never left me, so in 1986, I'm really aging myself now, I took the plunge and embarked on a three-year comprehensive nursing diploma at Nelson Polytechnic. I had wanted to do my psychiatric nursing training, but the only training available then was at Seaview at Hokitika. All those I spoke to told me I would be foolish to do psychiatric training when comprehensive training was available in the way of the future. I made my decision based on that prevailing wisdom. Once I completed the diploma, I returned to journalism to save money to travel again. Um, but a year later, I began looking for a nursing job in, in Auckland. None were available at Carrington, and I didn't get one at Kingseat. Very disappointed, I took a job in a surgical ward at Middlemore Hospital. While I loved the privileged intimacy of nursing, I found the health system structures and processes, particularly the hierarchies, quite crushing of my spirit. And I found the apathy and at times ignorance of my nursing colleagues about wider societal issues, particularly given we were nursing in South Auckland, uh, pretty depressing. I admire all of you who have stayed in the profession in the face of mounting and sometimes seemingly insurmountable pressures. I really do. 
I decided to leave and return to journalism, absolutely knowing that nursing was the nobler path, and I still feel that. On my last day on that surgical ward, the co-editor role was advertised and I applied and was appointed, and so began my many years at Kaisiaki as an employee of NZNO, which brings me here today. My presentation is not an academic one, nor is it developed from direct practice experience, so please remember that and <laughs> judge it as you will. Rather, it is an entirely personal opinion based on the plethora of factors that go into developing one's own opinions. Uh, observations, com conversations, reading, class and gender, and how these shape your personal values and beliefs, yours and others' experiences, both personal and professional, the cultural, religious, familial mores you're brought up with, political beliefs, the list goes on. So I make no claim that this position presentation is anything more or less in my opinion backed up by some reading I have done around the subject, but I hope that it may have resonance for some of you and may prompt some bigger picture thinking when it comes to considering the future of your chosen practice area. My basic premise is that mental health nursing has been colonised by general nursing and that unless practitioners reclaim, demand a different or modified registration and educational preparation and develop nursing leaders courageous enough to challenge the current structures, processes and paradigms, then mental health nursing is destined to remain just another nursing specialty. When patently it is far more than that. Particularly in the cultural context of Aotearoa and the very different understandings of mental health of tangata whenua, tangata whenua here in our country. I can put it no better than Australian-based academics Richard Lakeman and Luke Malloy, who in their 218 paper, Rise of the Zombie Institution, The Failure of Mental Health Nursing Leadership and Mental Health Nursing as a Zombie Category, published in the International Journal of Mental Health Nursing, they state, over the course of the 20th century, mental health nursing in Australia has endured changes to, to factors that were integral to its professional identity, the wind down of the standalone psychiatric hospital system, adjustments to its educational preparation, and the loss of the nursing profession's recognition of its difference through specialist registration have all contributed to an increasingly ambiguous role for mental health nursing in the changed world of 21st century mental health care, which is still changing, as we've heard from our last presentation. While referring to the Australian situation, their contention, I believe, holds true for New Zealand too. The seeds for the colonisation of mental health nursing were, I believe, sown in 1972 when control of psychiatric hospitals moved from the Department of Health to hospital board control. That move set in motion a cascade of events which have, over the succeeding dec decades, gradually eroded the strength, vitality, standing, esteem, unity, voice, and I believe humour, of the psychiatric mental health nursing profession. It laid the groundwork for the loss of United Union membership, and it laid the groundwork for the absorption of mental health nursing into general nursing. A situation which occurred, I said not far from here, which would have been the truth if I'd been speaking in Dunedin, um, here in the early 80s, is the microcosm of the impact of that change a decade earlier. Orokanui was a psychogeriatric facility at Waitati, and the Otago Hospital Board, in its infinite wisdom, decided to close Orokanui Hospital and replace it with a day-stay facility at Wakari Hospital with those patients needing full-time residential care to be cared for at Cherry Farm or non-governmental organisations. Psychiatric nurses were then employed under some designation 3001 and general nurses were employed under DG21. A month-long picket outside the hospital, supported by staff from Cherry Farm, did not stop the closure, but did result in some concessions. The PSA won a concession for the psychiatric nurses to work in the day stay unit for a period of five years. They could also maintain PSA membership for that time. After that, they had to have bridged to comprehensive registration and, if working in the day stay unit, become NZNO members. The picket also resulted in funding for psychiatric registered nurses to bridge to comprehensive registration. 
That event was succeeded by the establishment of acute mental health units within Dunedin Public Hospital and other general hospitals around the country, and with that, the burgeoning of NZNA membership among psychiatric nurses. Changes to legislation governing union coverage also contributed. The loss of psychiatric nurse training was not far behind, and mental health nursing education was absorbed, absorbed into comprehensive registration. How successful has that been in producing nurses grounded on mental health nursing theory, confident in the complex demands of mental health care, and empowered to advocate strongly and persistently for the resources needed for those in their care? Certainly the plague of chronic anxiety and depression and New Zealand's alarming suicide rates would indicate that whatever has happened within the wider mental health arena, it is not working. As one Australian commentator has stated, the vast investment in mental health drugs and the expanding mental health industry has not demonstrably improved the mental health of nations. Current Professor of Sociology at Cardiff University School of Social Sciences, Joanna Latimer, asks why nurses do not, as promised, seem to have been empowered or had their status elevated by the shift of nursing training into the academy. And I quote, moving nurse education into the academy was, of course, promoted and driven by the group whose interests it best served, nurse educators. But this move has not been entirely successful. She says the reasons for this are complex, but include the fact it divided education from clinical practice in many ways that undermined practice. Secondly, nurses' status and position is underpinned by an archaeology of problematic relationships, including the asymmetrical relation between medicine and nursing. One of the results of this asymmetrical relationship is the difficulties of making nurses visible as grounded in scientific evidence, where notions of evidence are dominated by the medical model of a profession, including that knowledge needs to conform to the scientific method with ever increasing pressure to get nursing research and practice to follow very narrow nation, notions of what constitutes scientific research. And thirdly, according to Latimer, nurse education has only partially shifted into the academic sphere. They are not brought into the heart of universities and institutes of technology, nor integrated into the hospitals and clinical settings in which they undertake clinical placement. They find themselves betwixt and between belonging to neither culture. Lakeman and Malloy state that nurses, including those who are identified as mental health nurses, are in large part a product of their education. While some academics in Australia might claim the, mental, the mantle of mental health nurse, or even might even be credentialed, by and large, full-time academics in Australia are conspicuous by their lack of recent meaningful experience in the craft they are supposed to teach. And don't get me started on the utter absurdity of performance-based research funding and how that demeans, discourages and disillusions any nurse intent on research that nurtures, nourishes and expands the body of worthwhile knowledge. Thus, I believe the impact of the assimilation of mental health nursing education into comprehensive education has been profound and long-lasting. No amount of education and support within a nurse entry to specialist practice program, no amount of preceptorship and mentoring can make up for the loss of a dedicated, standalone, robust education system. And I don't think the fragmentation of union coverage can be underestimated as, as a contributing factor to the loss of mental health nurses' voice, identity and influence. It's worth remembering that when psychiatric hospitals were still under the control of the then Department of Health, I don't really think I'm some kind of a dinosaur wanting to go right back to the 1970s. I'm not. But there are some lessons that have been completely lost, I believe. I believe. And I don't know, only my opinion. And, you know, we've all, as they say, they're like assholes, we've all got one. But um, we're still under the control. The PSA and the department couldn't, yeah, so this is a very interesting, I think. They could, when, Psychiatric hospitals were still under the control of the Department of Health. The PSA and the department could not agree on rosters. So PSA members made a unilateral decision 
to begin working the four on, two off, which is still a roster today, um, on a particular date. They did so, and that is how that roster was won. It wasn't through negotiation. It wasn't through. It was by members saying, we're doing it on the state. And they did. It was sub subsequently agreed with the Department of Health. That's power and influence. That's united voice, united union membership. The lack of courageous nursing leadership has also contributed to the erosion of mental health nurses' influence and voice. While many nursing leaders do their best, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to disparage every nursing leader, quite a lot of them, but not all of them. Um, means is influence and voice, um, they, and they do their best in difficult circumstances. We must always remember whether they are working for Te Whatu Ora, educational institutes, or other, any other organisation. Their primary loyalty lies with their employer. They may tell you otherwise. They might try to act in very difficult circumstances on behalf of both nurses and the patients, you clients you care for. But their primary loyalty is to their employer. Continued employment status or tenure dependent on adherence to the prevailing orthodoxies. It's a pretty effective muzzle. While operating in the very different US nursing landscape, nursing commentator Anita Nitsky writes that gender norms have contributed to nurses' weak leadership skills. We shortchange ourselves by deference to authority, by not insisting on representation, and by self-deprecation, a strategy that devalues us, erodes our self-esteem and belief in ourselves, she says. Lakeman and Malloy, when referring to the corporatization of health, and education, state, true to nursing's humble and servile beginnings and traditional deference to authority, nursing has been conspicuously quiet with respect to any of these changes. Arguably, it has demonstrated little resistance and appears on the face of it to be mostly acquiescent and conformist in satisfying the demands of the organisation. And uh, as somebody has observed nursing and health reforms over a number of decades. I can only agree. Joanna Latimer argues that there has been a switch in the alignment of nurses from patients to managers and an annulment of any prospect of promotion as clinical nurses with a few specialist exceptions, such as nurse practitioners and consultants. In respect of this last point, we need to ask how can a profession prosper when advancement means a career change from nursing to management? she asks. And in discussing factors that have contributed to mental health nurses' loss of voice, influence and identity, one cannot underestimate, here I am nailing my political colours very clearly to a particular mask, um, one cannot underestimate the corroding influence of close to 40 years of neoliberalism on the health and education systems. The neoliberal consensus on taxation, economic growth, and monetary policy, all of which have been abject failures in delivering equity or social justice in any form, is so deeply embedded as to be taken for granted as the only way of viewing the world. And that consensus has reduced the health and education systems to markets where pro Productivity and efficiency, however they are achieved, are lauded as primary values. Where managerialism reigns supreme, where the aridity of auditing and measuring is seen as some authentic gauge of success, and where genuine, conscientious, critical thought is anathema. Joanna Latimer has suggested that over the last three decades or so, nurses have been driven to priority to prioritize efficiency as a moral demand. And that, my friends, is the path to professional bankruptcy. Sadly, my observations, readings, and reporting over the last three decades has led me to agree with Lakeman and Malloy's contention in the same paper that in recent decades, powerful forces have contributed to the zombification of the mental health nursing workforce and the academy. 
as an aside, I'm proud to say Kaitiaki New Zealand published some of Richard's early work, both when he was a student and a neophyte academic. They argue that an increase in medical hegemony, the ascendancy of allied health and mental health service provision, the need for uncritical and servile work workers, protocol-driven work practices, and a failure to, of leadership to mobilise any substantial resistance to these trends have enabled the infection, zombification, to spread. This is a harsh, uncompromising view of mental health nursing, which I believe has some relevance and real resonance here as well as in Australia. While it is easy, if not welcome, to point out how mental health nursing's voice, influence and identity has been eroded, it is far more difficult to come up with ways of reversing that erosion and rebuilding a profession that can fulfil its essential remit as a transformative force for good. I can only offer a few suggestions. If I could wave a magic wand to bring about a transformation in nursing, I would ask for nursing to be rid of its obsession with, its adoration of, its belief in, and its respect for hierarchies, be they nursing, medical, or bureaucratic. And I have to say that my name gives something away about my heritage, and there is a certain strong anti-authority, you know, anti-authority streak there. So that is also where my some of my hatred of hierarchies comes from. It is no surprise then that a profession with its roots in the church and the military should worship hierarchies. But I firmly believe that it is this obsession with hierarchies, HCAs, EN, RN, CNS, NP, ACN, CN, ADON, DON, EDON, I probably miss out several, the list goes on and on, that bedevils nursing, sets nurse against nurse, embeds notions of superiority and thus inferiority, nullifies the essence of feminism, encourages patch protection, undermines equity, and mirrors the worst aspects of medicine. Enough said about that particular obsession of mine, but I firmly believe if we could eliminate hierarchies, nursing would be a far stronger and more united profession. And I know this will win me no friends, but I believe that nurses only fighting for across-the-board percentage pay increases rather than more for those on the lower rungs of the nursing profession's sacred ladder, promotes the values of elitism rather than equity. As stated in the title of this presentation, I believe political activism is essential to the restoration of the voice, influence and identity of mental health nursing. But of course, it is over to mental health nurses to firstly agree their voice, influence and identity needs to be strengthened. You may strongly disagree with my contention that, what is, that, this, that this is what is required and a different registration and separate education system is the best way of restoring your voice, influence and identity. identity. Whatever is agreed, and agreement is essential to unity in action, then the road to achieving that goal would be long and arduous. And nurses generally have not been well versed in the ways of political activism. Psychiatric nursing traditionally was a far more political working class and male driven profession than general nursing with its more middle class good girl values. But contemporary nursing, education, uh, nursing undergraduate education pays scant attention to the value and the necessity of political action by nurses. The drive for health equity and the importance of public health values, particularly in a post-COVID-19 world, will hopefully play an important role in ensuring undergraduate education pays far more attention to the importance of political act activism and advocacy by nurses. In a 2005 article in the Journal of Professional Nursing, Nurses' Political Involvement, Responsibility versus Privilege, three US nursing academics say nursing apathy towards participation in the political process is pandemic. They write that political involvement encompasses being knowledgeable about issues, laws, and health policy, like our early presentation, that's what you are doing here. They state that the implementation of a political role for a nurse is based on three levels of commitment, including, including survival, success, and significance. 
Survival includes individual involvement with communities. Success accepts challenges in addressing injustices, especially within the healthcare arena. Significant involvement uses visionary nurses towards the betterment of the nursing profession. And they say nurses can no longer be spectators in the political arena. And let's hope Maranga Mai Day of Action on April the 15th kicks off, you know, six months of concerted political action by nurses to achieve <clears throat> the funding that is so desperately needed <clears throat> and the numbers of nursing who are so desperately needed. But that's, that pipeline isn't going to be achieved in six months. Ways of involving nurses include raising their political awareness, awareness incorporating the importance and re relevance of political action in undergraduate and graduate education and teamwork. Back to US nursing commentator Nitsky, who says political activity takes the work of nurses, and I love this saying, this, from being a discrete event in one setting and raises it to a societal level. So that's, you know... Yeah, it's a long time since I was actively nursing, but it seemed very, very, when I was nursing, it seemed very focused on that unit where you were working. And I understand that the pressures of work <laughs> make you drew, go inward because Christ, how are you going to get through your day without doing that? But the work of nurses from being a discrete event in one setting and raises it to a societal level, we must always remember that, that we have... Um, a much wider role <laughs> to play, I believe, um, in, in working towards social equity. But fear has traditionally held nurses back, and certainly my experience when wanting to speak with nurses about what short staffing means for patient care, about their working conditions, about what impact a particular policy might have on their work or whatever, was that fear keeps far too many nurses quiet. Nitsky urges nurses to lose their fear, to band together, to find safety in numbers, to support those seeking change and those brave enough to speak out and to speak out themselves. And she urges nurses not to downplay the achievement of their colleagues. She too stresses the importance of nursing education, preparing nurses with skills of political advocacy, negotiation and articulating the value of our profession to the public that healthcare is not all about medicine and physicians. And she says that the most important reason to be politically active is because politics is a means for nurses to advocate for their patients. Another nursing commentator, Karen Desjardins, Desjardins in an article in the Aorn Journal, 20 years ago, said the public would not recognise nurses as patient advocates until they began to champion public health and social interview issues at institutional, community and national levels. A group of nursing academics writing in the New York State Nurses Association Journal in 2009 stated that political activism was a crucial complement to clinical practice. Nurses were in a unique position to not only provide bedside care, but also to advocate for change within the political arena and the community at large. The concepts of service, community, collaboration, empowerment and political activism were essential foundations in preparing nurses to meet the healthcare needs of individuals and communities. Back to academics closer to home, Lakeman and Malloy say that Challenge for mental health nursing in Australia, and I believe here, is where the collective voice of practitioners can be gathered. And as mentioned earlier, having New Zealand's mental health nurse's voice dissipated through four different organisations undermines any sense of unity or common purpose. I think that, you know, that is how you can come together across those union and professional association divides is absolutely at the heart of how you're going to strengthen your uh, influence and voice. They can annoy a harsh about the organisations that should be the advocates for mental health nurses. They write that both the Australian College of Mental Health Nursing and the Australian Nurses and Midwifery Federation, who would seem natural vehicles for dissent, and that they both advocate for conditions that, if realised, could strengthen mental health nurses in its fight against zombification. 
However, these organisations, being themselves conservative to the point of obsequiousness, have failed to stir significant action from those who might have power to effectively intervene. I hope my judgment on um, NZNO is not that harsh. <laughs> I'll remain silent about the College of Mental Health Nurses. Um, it is worth pondering whether the organisations which represent mental health nurses in New Zealand could be described thus. In a paper published last year, positioning psychiatric and mental health nursing as a transformative force in healthcare, four Swedish nursing academics stated that psychiatric and mental health nurses, whether clinicians, researchers, educators or managers, must contribute to achieving good health in, and well-being and reducing inequalities for all. They state that for this to happen, Psychiatric and mental health nurses need to overcome challenges posed by a dominant medical paradigm, the devaluation of caring, and the questioning of their professional expertise. This requires a renewed belief in the therapeutic potential of psychiatric and mental health nursing and the courage and perseverance of mental health nurses to shape their own future. While Lakeman and Malloy seem pessimistic about the current state of mental health nursing in Australia, they believe that only the recognition of zombification, active resistance against the forces that conspire to cause it, and the cultivation of genuine, conscientious, critical thought and debate offer the only hope of survival of mental health nursing as a thriving specialty. They conclude their paper by stating that recognition and resistance might offer some hope, and Australian experience might provide salutary lessons for the survival of mental health nurses in other parts of the world. And I can only hope that you, who work under such difficult conditions, can sit in caring for some of the most vo emotionally vulnerable and difficult patients, can see some way towards recognising and resisting what is going on within mental health care and shaping your own future in a way that is consistent with the values of your profession and which ensures the unique voice, influence and identity of mental health nurses takes it right, its rightful place at the centre of political activism, policy making and practice. Thank you. Um, thank you, Teresa. That's really um, mind blowing, actually. <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody in our audience or in our Zoom audience have any comments or want to make any uh, comments or ask any questions? Yeah, I think I agree with some of what you say. I think mental health nursing is very marginalized by the general nursing as well. I mean, in our situation, we've got two of our, we have a, in the um, nurse educator role, we have like four nurse educators, two of them are leaving, and, and mental health, for mental health, and that's like all of County's Manukau for the, all of their mental health nursing staff, that's inpatient community, and they've frozen those, Te Whata Ora have frozen those positions, so we're going to probably end up with um, 1.5 mental health nurse educator for all of our mental health nurses. Yeah, yeah I know that recognition and resistance. You know, it's it's a. I mean, I I don't pretend. It's a very difficult environment you work in now. Very difficult. But one of the benefits, I believe, of such short staffing is that nurses, you are precious. You are like gold dust now. You know. So if you say we are going to work, 1972, we're going to we're just going to start that roster on this date, you know. I, yeah, yeah. Well, that's and remember how it was won, and that you got because of the your preciousness at the moment, you have an enormous amount of power within that. Don't forget that. <laughs> That was um that was interesting. I never knew how that's how the four yeah, came about. Yeah, um, I, I, look, I have a, a comment as well, Teresa. I, look, I, I pick up on your point about 
the fragmentation of the mental health nursing voice across multiple organisations. Uh, and I, uh, the mental health nurses section recognises that this is a problem. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is, however, one that we are working on overcoming. You know, there are there is a, a, a memorandum of understanding. At various times, um, relationships uh, develop and, and improve amongst this, this cluster of mental health nursing organisations. Um, for a period of time, there were a number of us on the committee who were dual members of the PSA and NZNO, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that was helpful in building bridges between those two. Now, unfortunately, uh, last year, um, the general nursing membership of NZNO, in its wisdom, voted to change the rules of NZNO so that there's colonisation. <laughs> So that we can no longer have dual members holding office. But anyway, that's another matter. But what the, the so it is one step back, but there are two steps forward because the willingness is definitely there in the PSA's Mental Health and Addictions Committee and in the Mental Health Nurses section of NZNO to work closely together on political matters. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> and it needs to happen. I mean, just to comment on the nursing training part of it, while I, you know, I do hear what you're saying about, you know, having specialised training from the get-go, I can also, you know, think of numerous nurses we've had come through as students who were like, no, no, I'm going to be a this nurse or a that nurse, and actually getting a taste of what we do, have gone, oh, now hang on a minute, maybe yeah. I want to do this yeah. nursing, Whitney's sitting over there for a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, and, and so I think there's... You know, like I wouldn't want to lose one or the other. I think a hybrid would be yes, great. Yes, I, I mean, I, I do. Th I think that when I say a different form of education and registration, I don't mean necessarily throwing it, having an entirely standalone one, but I, because I think maybe a two year and then you branch out. I don't know. Yeah, that would be great. I'm not a nursing educator. I'm not. But, you know, I think that does, there needs to be something different because it's not it's not working at the moment. I, I believe. Well, we essentially have a four year. Program, yeah, with the three MS year foundation, PP. and then people come into these special, you know, the, the, yeah. the net, net P or the NIS yeah. programs in place. Yeah. So, I guess maybe recognizing that, in fact, it's four years now. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Any further comments or questions? Thanks very much, Teresa. Oh, I totally yeah. concur with what you're saying. I, I remember um, I started teaching at, Matt, at Wellington Polytech in 1982. And after the um, merging of to under comprehensive in the earlier decade, it began with 50% mental health, 50% general. And that has been so dissipated over the years. And then, um, you know, now it's just piecemeal. I remember that they, the teaching, the curriculum said that we would teach two hours on anxiety yet three hours on bed making and washing a patient. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you know, you tell me what actually works, uh, you know, and what actually proves effective in the long term. As for the politicization of nursing, I remember going to a head of school and say, tell me about your curriculum. Tell me what you do to help nurses become more political. She could only pull out one assignment in a postgraduate P primary health care, and she immediately changed the subject. The actual, and the word that we used to use all the time, not we, well, it was there, it was in the context, was we must socialize nurses. And we know exactly <laughs> what that meant. That meant to conform, to get yeah. behind, to do as we told. Plus, these systems are so distorted with the education. You're relying on the stakeholders to provide the um, educational yeah. experience. Yeah. So you, um, there's a bond that, you know, we'll, we won't take you if you don't do, as you say, the clinical, the um, tutors at the university, whatever, aren't well versed with um, what's going on there, nor are they necessarily well versed with the curriculums. So it's weak, weak, weak. Mm -hmm. And, it, it, you know, as far as actually helping nurses get a voice. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really unfair that the pipeline has been, you know, not good. And now, oh, yeah, yeah. non-feminist non too. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and now with understaffing, being as strong as it is, there's there's no um, ability to clan, get together. And as you say, it's so individual to then move up to a different higher level. And then with these four organizations all pitting for the different voices of nursing, it's mm -hmm. like, how do we do this? How do we do this? So, you know, it's inspiring and we're going to spread your word and your video <laughs> as far as we can. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, we have one question on Zoom. 
but or even two. Um, so, um, so one of them's more sort of a common. Uh, so one says, as a UK RMA, I face much discrimination in New, Ze in New Zealand for being a mental health registered nurse, and have much evidence of this. And she said, uh, they, sorry. I made an assumption that they said, um, I would like to write to you. And I didn't know there were others who had seen this too. Um, and they also said that New Zealand nurses new to mental health nursing gravitate towards UK mental health nurses, but are quickly discouraged by comprehensive nurses with some experience in mental health. And they also asked if a comprehensive nurse can become a mental health nurse, then why are UK mental health nurses have a limit on our um, APC to only work in mental yeah. health in New Zealand? Mm -hmm. um, UK training is under recognised, and that's certainly something that uh, I'm a UK trained Ironman as well. And it's yeah, certainly something yeah. I've seen. And, yeah, and we, I've certainly found that when I came over, uh, my, my husband and I would apply for jobs, and they'd say, Oh, well, you're not. And it's like, I've been working in mental health for 12 years, and it's mm -hmm. but it wasn't as recognised as um, a New Zealand comprehensive training with less mental health. Yeah, training. yeah I know. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> Um, and then uh, Sir Deb Cracknell says, uh, thanks, Teresa, it was brilliant, and I agreed with you. I work with NSP nurses. Can you please recap over the three levels of survival, success, and significant involvement again? How can we encourage NSP nurses to be more politically active? Uh, well, I, I mean, I do think it comes back to your, you know, your undergraduate education has to acknowledge that wider, you know, take nursing out of a discrete event in one setting to a far broader picture of what nursing should be, can be and should be. Um, and so I, I believe it has to start right at, at undergraduate level. And I I think there has to be some change in in the education of in the undergraduate education of mental health nurses. Whether that be standalone, whether it be a two-year foundation across, and then you specialise, not up to me to decide. But oh, excuse me, oh, excuse me, if you give me that person's name, I can get you the succession. You know those three S's. I can send that to her. Uh, hi, I just had a comment. So um, I'm a nursing lecturer, um, and I have been looking thoroughly through the new. Uh, Bachelor of Nursing and Bachelor of, well, I haven't looked as thoroughly in Bachelor of Māori. Um, but uh, the concepts coming through is that it's going to be fully integrated throughout the years of the curriculum. So that mental they have, health nursing. Yes, yeah. so they have physical and mental health nursing integrated throughout the years. The problem when we've discussed it as mental health lecturers is, so where are we teaching it? where are they having the clinical placement because it's so integrated now because we're not having this mind-body split that we're not quite sure where we're going to be actually talking about schizophrenia, for example. Yeah. Um, so there's huge challenges with the curriculum. Personally, I hate it. Um, but, you know, it is still going through the review process. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, well. Clinical placements are, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, that integration is, is a very interesting concept, isn't it? <laughs> and whether it is going to improve the, I don't, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I doubt if it does. Is all I can say. I doubt if it is, but I'm not a news educator. I'm only a. I'm not a news educator either. When I get hold of the student nurses I say to them well you know at the end of the day if you're what kind of nurse are you if you're not a mental health nurse given that you know 10 percent of the population have got mental illness shouldn't you really be a mental health nurse and then do the other stuff nurse? you know I talk about Mrs Brown and her hemorrhoid cream you know and she comes in you see her in the you know in a primary practice and when you see her for the 33rd time you think wow she's looking low and you make a uh, an intervention there and I don't see why maybe I'm biased but I don't see why they couldn't say every nurse should do maybe six months in an inpatient unit it's not long enough to have them flip through in a couple of you know six or eight weeks and when they get in there and they're supported right they make that change like the I can't remember which lady said 
um, you know, that they make a conversion. They never, they wanted to do paediatrics or whatever, and then they realise, actually, this is an area that I want to work in. It's much better than all my other placements because I'm actually a valued member of the team, you know. So I think that that would be the way I would do it if I was looking to increase the mental health nurses. Otherwise, you're only going to get specialised people who really want to do it for their own personal reason, and that cuts off a whole lot of other people. I don't know that, I mean, how do you affect that? I can't tell the ministry, the ministry's got their own agenda, but it certainly doesn't seem to me to be bolstering mental health nursing, you know, no, when, it's, when it's integrated, integral, yeah, yeah. and no different to anything else. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of points. I think um, as mental health nurses, we really need to be able to stand up and articulate what we do um, now. Mental health is becoming, um, nursing is becoming part of a uh, more generalist arena, I think, with allied health. Um, certainly in many areas, there's a huge um, push towards increasing the Kaiafina peer support worker workforce. Um, and um, I think as mental health nurses, we really need to start standing up to say what it is that we do and to value nursing um, within the mental health area because um, otherwise we we are particularly um, out in community settings, mental health nurses are being um, kind of pushed out of the workforce and being subsumed by other disciplines. So I think we start need to start making a really strong voice about what it is mental health nursing does. And, you know, as a, as a group of healthcare workers across our nation, nursing is the largest workforce. We do have a huge voice if we want to get political and to make some noise. Um, so it's about trying to think about what is our, our cause and... Um, you know, we've heard this morning around some of the legislation that's changing, and we do have an opportunity to use our voice um, to try and influence policy changes both within hospital settings and within um, the political arena, within at the ministry or within with politicians. So I think sometimes we kind of get tired and we think, I've just got to get through today. I've got patients to look after, and we very much... I think in that mindset at the moment, because yeah. we are so short-staffed, we do have high workloads, we feel like just getting through the day is a, a mission, actually. And um, But if we're not going to stand up and make a noise, then that kind of pressures are just going to continue on us till either we burn out and then it becomes worse, or, um, you know, who knows what might eventually happen, you know, there might be some kind of collapse of the health system and it's not looking pretty at the moment. So, mm. you know, we do have a, a chance to make a difference, I think. Mm. Any further comments or questions? Yeah, thank you. That was, Teresa, it was a really interesting point of view, which I agree with a lot as well. Um, so obviously I've been mental health nurse for many, many years. And um, I think the point you made about where who managers are aligned to um, or where they feel they're aligned to um, is very clear on occasions, particularly when you get the Ministry of Health coming around different areas, talking to team leaders, managers, whoever, wanting to know what are the issues in your area and those people are being silenced by the people above them yeah. don't tell them anything mm -hmm. um why they don't the ministry don't come and talk to the people that are you know on the ground doing the work doing the slog i have no idea but i just think it's appalling that that kind of thing happens and how do we go about kind of affecting change over there really yeah well it's just i think it is yeah always remember when <laughs> your boss's loyalty's lie and it ain't with you never has been never will be <laughs> I, don't, I don't i like what you're saying Claire. the you've got to ask yourself i think that let me just get my head together so the ministry of health i don't know this for sure right it's kind of like 
what I hear and what have you, that the ministry is influenced by the people that it's got embedded in groups and, you know, the, so they're achieving. Um, and I mean, I don't want to talk against them because I kind of believe, say, for example, in peer support staff, you know, and this is kind of like what the lady's saying over there, there's lots of, you know, uh, um, varying healthcare workers that are coming into what is our sphere of work, they are embedded, you know, they've got peer um, members in the ministry They've and, and we kind of don't have. And and so we support now, this is, I guess, is political and maybe a bit nasty, but, you know, our current government should be our assistance where we support them, we now, well, I presume that our unions collectively support the Labour Party. The Labour Party gets in government and says, well, they just don't want to do anything. So I guess, what am I saying? There's no embeddedness. We don't have an embedded, or that I don't know, that we have embedded people in the ministry where it should just where all the influence is coming from. Reduce seclusion. We know that that's not necessarily the right thing to do. Of course, it's what we want. It's that embeddedness. Who, who who are the people? It's the same like what you're saying. Who's who's making that curriculum that we're teaching the nursing council? Yeah, I mean, it's like we're delivering the services, but we don't really have any input into how there it's happening and the ministries where all the action is coming from, and we don't have anyone in there that I know of. You know, you, you know, your chief nurse. When was the the last chief nurse had any mental health? Education. Jane O'Malley did, didn't Jane she? Jane O'Malley. Yeah. But she, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the point that John makes is is, is very valid. I mean, as, a, as someone who has interfaced with the ministry yeah. from the nurses' organisation in the past, very aware that although there are nurses working at the ministry, um, in there, there is policy analysts or, or whatever, of those who are there specifically in a nursing role, the office of the chief nursing officer has single figures. In, is, is a, it's a tiny little unit off the side of the ministry, essentially. Um, and I mean, Joan O'Malley, you know, former chief nursing officer, was one with mental health experience. You know, Jane Bodkin was a great advocate for mental health nurses, but that's two people in the whole ministry. You know, that, that I were there yeah. as nurses, as with a mental health background. Um, so, very good point made about the um, the lack of embedding. That mental health nursing has in the ministry. Um, can I just say that I cover mental health nursing and um, cancer nurses for NZNO. A week ago, we were in Auckland for the Cancer Nurses College. Um, for a pre, um, conference, and Rose Simpson came from Te Ao Kahu, the Ka Cancer Control Agency. She gave us fantastic talk, gave us an overview of where we're going with cancer control. She was very open. Now, we asked Tony Dalden to speak, and he refused from the Ministry of Health, from mental health. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really hard to get the emphasis. Even and, and last week I learned about ovarian cancer. More women die from ovarian cancer than the road toll suicide and melanoma put together. One in 78 get ovarian cancer. Where can we, and 90% and of people cannot name one symptom of over, ovarian cancer. So where is our education opportunities? Where can we say, how do we prevent? You know, it's like, do we put anxiety vans that aren't labeled anxiety vans in the community for all the anxiety that is going on and it's just going through the roof. We have to get our voice out. It, and I, Teresa, you made that comment. Until the public sees us as influencing the public and their outcomes, and we can talk about our problems and the understaffing and everything, but we have to, we have to lift to a level of how do we educate these people? How do we educate ourselves? And your point, Katie, about, you know, um, new entrants going to UK-based, um, you know, trained nurses because they're more practically based than the comprehensive, you know, we've got to really say something. And, and as for, I, I tried to get on the committee for Te, Te Pekanga for the curriculum. And I, I knew somebody who was very much into it. And um, she, when I asked, you know, never heard, never even was acknowledged to, you know, say I was going to. And she said, did you detect that you were of Maori origin? I mean, I am a fifth generation New Zealander, but uh, no, I'm not from uh, Maori, uh, Iwi. And she said, that's why you didn't get on. 
And you're sort of going, well, wait a minute. We need wider voices than just, yes, the decile, the low, the terrible outcomes from out of your, you know, hideous. Cancer, the terrible, you know, mental health. We know that. But, you know, we need the voice to be um, balanced and, and, and representative as well. You know, we do have to make up for the deficits in healthcare that we haven't delivered across the board on so many points. So please get involved is basically my message, just like Teresa, get involved and we'll say more mm -hmm. at the BGM. Yeah. Yeah. So stuff on I think so stuff. Um so I just final comment is that um people might remember the cut right for inquiry of 1987. Um, and that was a precursor for legislation around our Health and Disability Act and our um, legislation around patient rights and consumer rights and health. So prior to that, there pretty much was none. Um, and during that inquiry, one of the things that Dame Sylvia Cartwright um, said um, as a, a part of her outcome um, from the inquiry was that the voice of nurses was silent. And whilst nurses were cognizant of what went on in that um, um, National Women's, National, National Women's. Yeah, National Women's Hospital um, during that where they were doing the experimental treatment on women without their knowledge or consent. Nurses knew it was happening, but they kept silent about it. Mm -hmm. So again, um, partly because I suppose of the hierarchy of the system at the time, nurses were quiet. But again, you know, if you've got such a... Um, and um, knowledge about something that's wrong, we do need to speak up. And mm. so we do have a voice and we do need to start exercising our voice. Mm. Mm. Um, thank you so much, Teresa. It's been a really, really interesting um, discussion this morning. And um, we're so grateful that you decided to hop on a plane and come and talk to us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's lunchtime. I'm not sure if lunch is up there yet. It is? Okay, that's really good. Um, so we'll be holding our um, BGM at 12.40. So you've got 40 minutes to eat your lunch and hopefully come back for the BGM. Um, one thing that we would like to say is that um, joining this um, section for Mental Health Nurses section of NZDNO, it's free if you are an NZDNO member already. So um, a lot of people actually don't know that. Um, we currently have 418 members across the country, so um, we'd love you to join up if you're not already a member. Can you just put on my desk? Because the chair says you've got to tick three options. You can. You can tick up to three options, but you can just tick one. Yeah. So this is the, for those on Zoom, this is the hard copy form that we're putting around in the room, the membership form. Um, you can also join online, and we'll put the link in the Zoom chat shortly uh, for those who'd like to join. Oh, yes, and the 0800 number as well. Yeah. Um, we, we really want to encourage people to come back, please, for the BGM at 1240. We do need to have a certain number for a quorum. Otherwise, we won't be able to pass any of the important rule changes and uh, that, we, that we really need to make to continue operating. Um, and also, over lunch, think about standing for the committee. We have vacancies, and uh, any member can put themselves forward to stand for election to the committee and be part of organising events like this, representing mental health nursing uh, to the ministry and other authorities uh, and tearing down the hierarchies, as Teresa encourages us to do. Certainly. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, karakia, karakia kai. Uh, whakapaingia e nei kai, hei o ranga mo o mata tinana, panga e hoki o mata wadu ki te taro te ora. Kia ora. At 12.40, please. Good. Yeah. 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 Y
Um, can people on Zoom hear us now? Yes, great, okay. Okay, so we just did some preliminaries, um, so we're all good to go. Um, so we've done the apologies. Is there any other apologies apart from Helen Garrett? Um, so I was trying to understand it going around for the people in the room and um, names be collated from our Zoom participants that are online. Um, the agenda has also been circulated online. Um, and if there are any other matters arising, we'll ask those at the end of our business today. So the minutes of the 2019 BGM have been circulated and will be taken as read. Um, are there any additions, deletions or other corrections to the minutes? All right. So if the minutes of the um, 2019 BGM are accepted, um, I'd like to move that they correct record. Um, I will second that uh, as the person who was also at the 2019 BGM. All those who were present at that can, the previous, uh, can vote to say whether or not they're correct and should be adopted. Is yep. that right, Jenny? Yep. So is there any objections to those minutes being adopted? No. So all in favour? Yep, aye. Right. Thank you. Uh, are there any matters arising out of those minutes? No. So um, we've had no official correspondence for the BGM. Um, we don't need a timekeeper. Um, so I'd now like to ask Grant to read the chairperson's report, please, on behalf of Helen. Yep. Thank you, Jenny. So this is um, a report that's been drafted by Helen Garrick, our chairperson, who, as Jenny mentioned, is an apology today due to a bereavement. Um, so I'll just skim briefly over this. I won't read it word for word. Um, it's been four years since our last biennial general meeting. Uh, it's supposed to be held every two years, but of course we've had COVID in the meantime. So this report covers the period 2020 to 2022. Um, and we thank the uh, previous and current committee members who are named there on the screen, welcoming, welcoming the new new people. It's new since the last BGM, myself, Fiona McNair and Katie. There were some um, highlights of the last two years that are bullet pointed there, which indicates some of the work that the committee's been doing over the last two or three years. We, so the committee is represented on various external forums, including with the Ministry of Health, TAPO, um, in, the, in the Ministry of Health again. And we also have uh, engagement meetings with Te Aumaramatanga, the New Zealand College of Mental Health Nurses, and with the Directors of Mental Health Nursing. The consultations that we have submitted on include responses, we did some media work uh, talking about mental health service deficits, including stuff in newsroom articles. We gave feedback on He Ara Oranga framework, which has been mentioned this morning. That's the report of the inquiry into mental health addictions. We've also given feedback on uh, He Ara Athena framework on the Mental Health Commission. That's the, the unregulated, is it, yes, sorry, yeah. And we, we, yeah, these are some of the concerns that we continue to have and we, other submissions we've made. So over the past few years, we've had Philip Ferris Day, who's uh, now a past member of our committee, who represented us on the CCDM Mental Health Advisory Group. Um, Jenny has taken over Philip's role there. Cecil Williams, who was a former committee member, was working on the NCDNO Addressing Violence Against Nurses Working Group. And Brent Doncliffe, who is a, again a former member, and Jenny were part of the NZNO Constitution Review Advisory Group. So this is some of the internal NZNO work and external liaison with uh, stakeholders in mental health that the committee's done over the last uh, few years since our last BGM.
So we welcome human communication from our members, whether by email or Facebook. We have a Facebook group, the NZNO Mental Health Nurses section, it's called. Um, and we welcome new committee members as well. So what we're going to do shortly is to elect a committee. Um, and we will we do have vacancies, as mentioned earlier. So if anybody wishes to put themselves forward from the floor today, they're most welcome. Can you just explain that the Yes, true. So currently we have three vacancies. Right, yeah. And so if we get three nominations, there's no, no election required because we only have eight positions. Um, hopefully, you know, we, we can dream of getting three people to put themselves forward, I think. Uh, but in any anyone is going to be most welcome to join us from this room and from on Zoom. So I will move that the chair's report be accepted. Are you going to second that, Jenny? Do we have somebody to second that? Is there any, com any comments or questions before we put it to a vote to accept the report? Thanks. It's pretty standard stuff, isn't it? Oh, pretty standard stuff. Okay. So, now do I share your report, Jenny? Oh, do you want to put a vote? Put your, your so, do we need to call a vote to that? To, to accept, to accept, to the, accept the report. All in favour? Yep. Aye. Aye. Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, so, the next thing on the agenda is uh, treasurer's accounts, uh, treasurer's report. Right, right. Uh, yep, you can put those up. So, for the last for three years, I have been the treasurer for this um, section. Most of our accounting is done by the NZNO accountant, so it makes the treasurer's job really easy. Um, and so I just like to read the commentary on the accounts, which have all been circulated to members. Oh, right. So I'm sorry, I don't. Right. Are they numbered? Ah. So are we on two? Yes. Yes, we are. And <clears throat> so this actually um, covers two um, years of financial um, reporting. So the income for the 2021 financial year was 13,998, consisting of core funding of $13,746, foreign registrations for 130 and interest earnings of 122. Our expenses totaled 844. 8,442, resulting in a net surplus of 5,524 after tax. <laughs> Committee meeting expenses in 2021 and 22, funded by NZNO, comprise of travel accommodation meals and other meeting expenses. Um, core funding was to cover these expenses was 13,746 in 29 and 20, um, and a surplus on core funding of 7,244 dollars was made due to fewer than budgeted face-to-face -face meetings as a result of the COVID-19 lockdowns. Other expenses in 2021 included $1,701 for forum expenses and bank fees. So the mental health nurses section ended the financial year at 31 March 2022 with cash at bank and on a term deposit totaling $24,164 compared to 18769 at March 31, 2021, an increase of just over $5,000. Uh, the increase can be attributed to the surplus in 21-22, during um, which we had less expenses due to COVID-19 lockdowns. So our main um, expenses are around um, costs for the committee to come together, um, New rules within NZ and O allow us only two face-to-face -face meetings per year. So we usually meet here in Wellington and um, our expenses for accommodation and travel are paid for. And, um, and that's the most of our expenses apart from expenses for this forum. And um, what else? Otherwise we meet via Zoom, which doesn't really cost us anything. So um, if anybody's got any questions about our accounts, I'm happy to take questions. If not, I'd like to remove uh, to move that this report is accepted. No second. Um, oh, it's okay. Sorry, Katie. Sorry, Katie. Sorry, yep. Katie. <laughs> so, if people are happy to do that, I'll just call for a vote. Is there anybody that would like to abstain? Call uh, votes for. Yep. Against. This is carried. 
um, professional nursing advisor report, Anne. Okay, thanks. That's the bones. What shows the bones. Here, this. I see yours, Anne. This is yours here. Yeah. I can't like you. Okay. Help things and read it out. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Van Brinkman, professional nursing advisor with mental health. And I have for probably about eight years, I hadn't counted, but it's been about that long. So I've watched this, I think one of my main jobs today, I mean, it's here, it's on the website, you're more than welcome to read it. And the last thing you want me to do is read this um, as such. But um, I, two, two main points for me are that one, I have to thank the committee. This wouldn't happen if it weren't for the committee. The committee really toil hard, and that's why they'd love to have more. Not that we they would want to um, put a whole lot of work on you, but just to raise the um, profile, get more perspectives is really helpful. So it's better, you know, it's further representation to take things forward. But so I'm really thanking the committee who have really put their um, best efforts forward without a doubt and have gathered and you saw with in with what Grant read out from Helen, how many um, submissions, where the representations go, the latest one, and I don't have it here, do I? It's on my, over there. Um, just the College of um, Mer Mer Teo Matanga. Uh, us and who's the third one again? Yeah, the, the the Dons, the mental health Dons. They're doing a. It's called the Stepping Stones into the Future, where they're try, they're trying. So those three organizations, three groups, are trying to s define how mental health nursing will look in the future. So that's important. It's important. It's will be going out for consultation. Soon. Soon. <laughs> Can you define that? No, I'm, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, yeah, it, but it's coming. So please pay attention, you know, give your, it, your attention if you can, because it will be then a more respected document because it's cohesive and um, more, further represent, represented, as has been alluded to today. Um, it's very hard with the voice. The, the other message I was going to give was political, but obviously Teresa's done a fantastic job of that. But it's the voice because we've got PSA, as you know, we've got an MOU, as Grant has alluded, is taught, spoken about with that, which says, you know, we can't poach on each other's territory and all this sort of thing. Um, the college, we have had, we even had an MOU with them um, when Ann Brebner was the chair, but it just doesn't seem to be, it sort of has faded. And things, and you know, we'll have to take responsibility for that as well. But for various reasons, it, it faded out, and um, and us. So that's three different representations. Who was the fourth? I heard somebody say something about a fourth. Is it the mental health? Oh, okay, it must be the mental health dons. Okay, um, and and so how are we going to get that voice that was so strongly in? Um, Teresa's messaging, and um, that's and we want people to sit up. When, when you speak and when, when you have something to um, put forward and we have to get the public, which is what the, uh, that's the third message I have to talk about, Modern Amai, which is the action day on the 15th of April. It's a Saturday. Um, it's being held in major centers around the country. Uh, Grant being on the board will be, in, you know, integrally um, involved as such. But it's all about every, every nurse everywhere. So I, you know, so that everybody gets the same conditions, everybody gets the same, you know, points of pay, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I know I've said this to some and the ICU nurses will go, we're special, we have extra talents. All I can say, you know, and this is just my personal opinion, is let's work collectively because numbers are massive. It, the numbers are really big. We'll get more um, traction. Work to your passion whatever your passion is. And I think John's point earlier was really interesting to say, by giving six months with your suggestion, or I, I'm not sure, John, exactly, you know, nurses who weren't planning to do mental health, but because they came, they, you know, saw, they, you know, the Vinny Vidi Vici, they, and they thought, yeah, this is for me. We can bring in more people into this specialty field, as it were, but, but 
you know, so the idea is to raise the public profile. It is not a strike on April 15th. It's from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And um, it's to because this is an election year to try to say, hey, we are here. We do count. And also Grant might come in here with the bus. There's a bus plan. Uh, it's, I think it's afterwards. Isn't it? It's afterwards. Yeah, it's not on the day. But I, I mean, NZNO is trying to raise the profile of, of nurses and having the influence on the election outcome. You know, the, the plan is to ask each party to answer questions so everybody can see, well, what do they represent in health? Because health affects us all one way or another, be it family or friends or whatever. So, um, yeah, so that, that's what it's all about. But um, so I just want to say thank you to the committee. They're fantastic. They do, do so much work on your behalf. And they would really, really love your input, be it, you know, through feedback. But at participation would be wonderful. Okay. So you're very welcome. I mean, to come, not because I speak. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for you? I think so. Yeah. Sorry, um, would you like to move that one? Would you like to somebody move the edge port? I'll move it up. Okay, somebody second it, please. Thank you. Thank you. So, all in favor? Yep. Aye. Eight. Right, thank you. Next. Uh, so. Next, we have a few remits um, that have been put forward by a member for um, to amend our rules. So, yeah, so remits are proposals to, to amend the rules of the section. Uh, the rules are on the website, and there are three, three proposals to make small changes. And these are, oh, four, sorry, four, four proposals. I need are coming up now. So you would have all got a copy of the rules um, in your bag today. Um, yeah. If you really want to study them, yep, yep. So um, these rules remit. Um, first one is that a new sub clause eight a two a be inserted to read that the NZNO professional nursing advisor with the responsibility for mental health and addictions shall be an ex officio member of the national committee. For the sake of clarity, the NZNO Professional Nurse Advisor on the National Committee under these rules shall also be counted as a member for the purposes of attendance quorum under Clause 1A of these rules. And what, what that means is Anne, um, Anne is included in our committee, essentially. Uh, the change to, to include our Professional Nurse Advisor as, as part of the committee, um, although Anne might be Anne is a, is a support support to the committee isn't isn't going to vote. She'll be part of the committee for everything else. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> this remit has been proposed by Brent Donker, and um, I'd like to second it. Do we have um, any any, comments, any or comments or questions about it? Can we move to a vote? So I um, like to vote. Does anybody uh, sorry for those to vote for? All in favour say aye. Yep, aye. aye. Anybody against? No. Right, so that's carried. I think that these changes are not, not particularly consequential. There's no earth shattering ones that I can no, see. No, they're all basically just around making a making the committee work better together. Yeah. That's the purpose. Yeah. yeah. Um, so another rule remit two um, eight a three a that the new sub clause to read um, clause eight a three of these rules shall not prevent a retiring national committee member being recalled to fill a vacancy under clause eight c three of the rules. So there be some insufficient members elected to the national committee. Anybody who is recalled under this clause shall be limited to an additional three year term or until the next national committee elections are held, whichever is the longer period. At which time the two year stand down per clause 8A3 of these rules shall apply. So, in plain English, uh, there is an explanation there under rationale, but in mm -hmm. plain English, what this means is currently on our committee, people are only allowed to remain on the committee for two periods of three years at a time. So, six years in total. Just, just fix this. Can you just look at the chips? <clears throat> Um, so people are only allowed to remain on the committee for a maximum of six years. Now, 
We don't have a lot. We've got vacancies at the moment, as, as mentioned many times already. Um, and it, it's, it can be quite hard for many uh, membership organisations to get um, volunteers to take on roles. This is a common problem in, across many organisations. And so what that means is that when we've got valuable experience committee members who have reached the end of their six years, we would like to be able to keep them on if there's no one else available. That's essentially the purpose of this change. So that was also um, moved by Brent John. Oh, can I have a second, please? Would we like to second that? No, yeah, 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 thanks, Claire. Claire. Okay, so all in favour? Yep. Aye. Aye. Anybody against? Right, great, thank you. Uh, remit three, uh, rule remit 8B2A, that a new clause 8B2A be inserted to read in the event of there being no quorum at a biennial general meeting or other special general meeting, the National Committee shall remain in the same membership and shall have the continued powers assigned per these rules until such time as a BGM or SGM can be held and has an attendance of members which meets the quorum established under 8B2 of the rules. So again, this, I mean, very briefly, when I rushed through the chair's report before, it did mention that in 2022, we attempted to hold a biennial general meeting to uh, re-elect a committee, but we didn't get a quorum. And so what this rule change aims to do is to deal with that situation where there's not enough people at the meeting to, um, to have an election. And what this means is that the current committee would stay until we could get another meeting to, 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 to do a new election. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, again, it's an unfortunate situation that meetings sometimes don't have enough people at them uh, to make to make these decisions. And so, what do you do then? So again, this this has been put forward by Brent Doncliffe, and I'd be happy to second that very much. Um, so, all in favour? Right. Anybody against? Right. Passed. Thank you. And remit four is that a new clause 10 E B inserted to read, excuse me, in the event of a failure to meet the attendance of members quorum set in AB2 these, of these rules, the National Committee shall set a new date for the meeting no later than six months later, and that the National Committee shall continue to exercise its powers and functions un, under 8B2 of these rules. So again, this follows on from the previous rule change, where we said that if we didn't get enough people at our BGM to elect a new committee, the old committee would stay. And this one says, but only for six months until we have time to try again. Um, okay, so again, that's moved by Brent Bonclough. Can I have somebody to second that, please? Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. Um, all in favour? Yeah. Aye. Against? Thank you, Carrie. Is there any general business anybody would like to raise? Okay, so today we've had um, a nomination for um, Debbie Watson to come on the committee. So Debbie is lecturer from SIT um, from Invercargill. Um, and the current committee members, uh, the five of us, are, are putting ourselves forward to continue on the committee. Helen, who um, has reached the end of her six years, um, may be now asked to stay on if there's, if there's still vacancies, because we've just approved that rule change that says we can keep people on if there's not enough volunteers. Is there anyone else who'd like to put themselves forward to join the committee? either on Zoom or in the room. I don't see anyone on Zoom. No. So Debbie, thank you. We'd love to have you on the committee. I'm sure you'll be um, a great asset to us. Oh, would you have a vote to approve? Oh, right. oh, right. oh, right. Approve Debbie and the current committee returning. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So all in favour? All right. Against? Great. Sorry, Anna, I'm not understanding. 
Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay, so that's all of the business for the meeting, apart from drawing the spot prize. So thank you all for attending. Um, our next BGM will probably be in about two years. I think so. I might likely be retired. <laughs> and so we're going to uh, have the prize draw now for the lucky section member who's in the room or on Zoom who wins the Prezi card. Has to come forward because we've had to do everybody's name. So because of Zoom. Come on in, come to the, to the um, um Just to explain the, um, uh, on the hoof. Uh, rules here uh, because we can't see everybody on Zoom as such. Um, Teresa is going to pull a name out of the hat. Everybody's name who's a participant today is in here. And so, what we need is you either to be here face to face or come forward on the Zoom in order, in a, you know, in other words, be present okay. in order to claim the prize. I hope, is that okay? Everybody's happy enough? Which, you know, we don't have a policeman, but. We have Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can be quite scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's doing it nice and Sam Rodney Hudson. If we're getting a response. Are you there, Sam? Are you out there? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, <laughs> counting down, Sam. Five, four, three, two, one. Sorry. <laughs> and just also to explain that the committee members are not in the draw. So it's going to be one of you lucky people uh, who wins. Trish Rest, my son. Are you there, Trish? Yes. Trish Rasmussen. Help, help. No, okay. Trisha Stitch Spring? Oh, Trish is here. Let's see. Trish. Yes, is that you, Trish? <laughs> oh no, I have to I have to, I have to type. Anyway, Trish history. How can you prove your identity? Patricia, Patricia stitch free to everyone. I'm here. Good on you. And also Trish. Look, two. We have two lucky winners. Is it? Trish, everybody, and Patricia. Are they the same person? The same person? Yeah, Patricia, are you also Trish? Stitch Brew? No, I don't think so. It's good one. Same surname. That would be very, very unusual. I'm in Palmerston North. All right. We've got both down. Sure, thank goodness that's over with. Um, we now, Jenny, you want to choose our next speaker? Okay. Yes. So I'd like to now introduce um, Erica Butters. So Erica works as the director for the Personal Advocacy and Safeguarding Adults Trust. And I've heard um, Erica speak before at a, um, a forum of um, mental health service coordinators and needs assessors um, at a forum we had um, a couple of years ago at 
Wellington Airport. And very engaging speaker, very knowledgeable. And Eric is going to come and talk to us about um, principles of supported decision making and a rights based approach. So thank you so much, Erica. Okay. Oh, we don't need that to be in this place. Oh, well, I think if you want the PowerPoint, then you do it. Um, that looks a little bit better. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm speaking into this microphone to you and to you, I believe. Um, oh, it's not shared. Okay. So let's go Oh, that's not what we want. I'll leave you to do it. It's all right because we've got time. <laughs> We're ahead of schedule. Just click on that one. Yeah. And then share screen. And then just screen one, I think. Okay. Yeah. Can they see it on Zoom now? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go from the beginning. Okay, that looks like we might be working for everyone. It's working here, and is it working online? It's working online, but it's small. Okay, so this. <laughs> currently being presented, but it's extending the screen instead of Zoom is. Okay. So we're still ahead of time. We've still got, I think I'm was scheduled to start at 1 30 and it's 1 28. So we're all good. So I'm going to talk about supported decision making today. And I wasn't able to be here with you in the morning, but I think you've already been talking about this or skirting around it in talking about capacity, talking about informed consent, all of these types of things that are complex and interwoven. And we're going to talk about supported decision making today. Now, when Jenny invited me to speak here today, my first response was, um, I don't have a clinical background. I'm not particularly um, experienced in mental health. So I can talk about supported decision making and human rights and principles. And she was like, yes, that will work. 
So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I hope that that's what will work for you. Um, because they are human rights and principles, they're the same. Exactly. They, they have universal application. So I'm sure that we'll be all good. Okay. How do I advance it now? No, it's not. I think I need to. Click. There we go. I, I need to click on that screen. Okay. So I'm Erica Butters. I've already been introduced, but I'm the director of the Personal Advocacy and Safeguarding Adults Trust. It's a long name, um, but we do exactly what our name describes. We advocate and safeguard adults in New Zealand on a personal level. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our organization later so you have a context for where I'm coming from. And I've put our website there in case you want to learn a little bit more. So here's an outline of what we're going to talk about. We'll talk about safeguarding first. And some of you may be like, I thought we were talking about supported decision making. And I'll explain why we start with safeguarding soon. We're going to talk about uh, what supported decision making is, who may need support. Then we're going to talk about capacity. I know that John Dawson has already spoken to you about capacity. He is the expert and I am not, but I will, I'll still raise it. Um, we'll talk about practical, practical supported decision making steps, will and preference. We'll talk, I'll introduce the concept of an adult at risk and who is an adult at risk, and then I'll talk about our organization. So starting at what is safeguarding? Safeguarding. Well, I've got the definition there. I was going to ask you to give me an answer, but I've given you the answer. And I, I guess this is a good point as well to pause and say, we're a small enough group that if you have questions at any time, please ask them when you have them. Okay? Like, put your hand up, call out, we'll chat about it. Okay? There's a mic. We can accommodate it. We'll also have time at the end, but my style is very much that Let's, let's talk about it when you're thinking about it. So I'm not going to be offended if you call out or interrupt. It will, I'll actually be quite excited if you do. So back to what is safeguarding? Safeguarding is a word that has a lot of different meanings and connotations for different people. Sometimes people think of safeguarding as something quite negative, something that is only about the elimination of all risk wrapping up in cotton wool, doing a double layer of bubble wrap, and then tucking in a corner and shutting the door. That is not safeguarding. So let me introduce this definition of safeguarding. Safeguarding is a range of activities and responses that promote, I don't know if I'm quoting this exactly, but it's close enough, uh, that promote uh, rights, well-being, and culture as well as preventing harm, abuse, and neglect. Now, this is a two-part definition. There is an important and in the middle. So if you have a response that is only about promoting rights and well-being and culture, but it doesn't take into any consideration prevention of harm, abuse, and neglect, then that is not a safeguarding response. The flip side of that, if you have a response that's only about preventing harm, you know, wrapping in the co cotton wool in the corner, but it's not about promoting rights and well-being, then that is not a safeguarding response. It has to have both. And why am I even talking about safeguarding at all? Because safeguarding has a continuum of responses. There are things that you can do that are preventative, and there are things that you can do that are responsive or reactive. And supported decision making is one of those things on this continuum. So you can have education and training, supported decision making, independent advocacy, and then there is a specific response called safeguarding adults from abuse, which is reactive responding to harm that has already occurred. You can see that these, um, each of these activities is not mutually exclusive. They cross over. 
So there's a little bit of supported decision making in education and training and also in independent advocacy. And that's the way it needs to be. There needs to be some fluidity between these things. But supported decision making is a safeguard. It is something that promotes rights, well-being, and culture, and it prevents or eliminates harm, abuse, and neglect. So let's talk more about supported decision-making. What is it? Um, I'm going to ask you now to answer. Thank you. We have a mic. And um, throw anything out there. It's pretty broad in what it can include. Okay, off you go, Jenny. Um, so many of you might have seen that the Ministry of Health put out some new guidelines around um, the Mental Health Act and a human rights approach um, last year. And part of that document talked quite a lot about supported decision-making as a way to trying to ensure that um, human rights are protected in Mental Health Act processes. So... Um, I guess one of the things that comes to mind is about good communication and offering choice. Love it. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, that means we got lots to learn, <laughs> which is good. So I was recently, um, well, in 2019, I was in a working group for the Ministry of Social Development who was tasked with the job of bringing together professionals from all sorts of sectors and industries, including mental health, including disability, including aged care, including um, children, to come together to craft a shared understanding and then a resource that reflected that shared understanding of supported decision-making. How do you think it went? <laughs> so, so people are laughing. So it went okay, but we never had a published resource and that work stalled. Fast forward a few years and we've now picked that work up again. So this working group has been reconvened and saying, look, this is still important. It's more important that we get this right. And so just today, I think it was probably an hour before I arrived here today, I sent off an email that um, had this definition in it of supported decision-making in the context of this working group and a shared understanding across sectors. And it said, again, I'm not going to have it verbatim, but it said that everyone has the right to make decisions, everyone has the right to access support to make those decisions, and everyone has the right to experience the outcome of their decisions. Supported decision-making is the name that we give to the process that makes this possible. Then I also said, that's basically the definition, but then I also said supported decision-making is broad and can include both informal and formal activities, as well as, uh, I think I said that it can vary in their intensity. But the most important part is just that it's about rights and it's the name for the process to make sure everybody gets those rights. It is something that was introduced through the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Now, we've got this weird thing in New Zealand where we have a disability sector over here and we have mental health over here and often pushing between these two areas. But actually, the social model of disability says that a person is disabled through the barriers that they encounter in society and the way that those barriers interact with themselves and any impairments that they may have, that that is what is disabling. Disability isn't something that is intrinsic to a person and it can be, in fact, removed. People can be enabled in their society if the right supports are there. So with that social model of disability and understanding, mental health, mental illness, psychosocial disabilities, it's all for the United Nations purposes, one and the same. Uh, it was introduced in Article 12 of the UNCRPD. Oh, that 
did something I didn't expect, but that's okay. We'll just go there next. Um, it was introduced in Article 12, and uh, it says exactly what I said in that definition, that it is a universal human, human right that everyone can make decisions and everyone can access support for those decisions and experience the outcome of those decisions. So I know we said everyone, but who are we talking about when we talk about who may need support for their decision making? Well, it may be people that have diminishing capacity, older adults, dementia. It may be somebody that has had a traumatic brain injury of some kind or a stroke. It may be someone that has neurodiversity. It could be somebody with a learning disability. Could be somebody with FASD. Could be somebody with mental illness or mental distress. And because capacity is about not just cognitive functioning, but also about the ability to communicate that cognitive functioning, supported decision-making could also be rel relevant for people that struggle to communicate in uh, intentional ways even if their cognition is 100%. But in reality, all of us do use supported decision-making all the time. So I used uh, supported decision-making today. I asked Google, where is the Harborside Function Center? And Google gave me an answer. So Google supported my decision-making on how to get here. But I would probably ask somebody else for different decisions that I would need to make in my life. Um, and that is an important part of supported decision-making, that the support will change depending on the person, depending on the decision. So if I wanted to make a decision about um, important medical treatment, I would probably wouldn't ask Google, and I'm sure Google would have a lot to say. I would ask a doctor. As you can see, uh, supported decision-making does cross over sectors and population groups. And in the disability sector, we have a saying that um, there are the disabled and there's the not yet disabled. <laughs> and it's kind of like that with supported decision-making. There's people that require for support for decision-making now or people that will at some point in the future. We are all in this situation. So it's we all have a vested interest to understand it, both for ourselves as the decision makers and for when we're in the role of being a supporter. Capacity. So what is capacity? I know John has already spoken about it. Um, so I hope that what I say is in line with what he has said. But uh, capacity has got a, a definition that takes into consideration um, the a person's ability to understand and retain information, a person's ability to forecast the outcomes from the decisions that they would make, and a person's ability to communicate their decisions. So that three parts to capacity. And on the slide, you will see that uh, there's the term mental capacity. That's what that is referring to, those, those three things. Um, the ability to understand and retain information, the ability to forecast consequences or see, into, see the outcomes, the potential impact, and the ability to communicate those decisions. Next on the side, you'll see legal capacity. What is legal capacity, do you think? Well, you probably know. Well, I think I learned this morning that it, it, it varies by the area because uh, it's defined mm -hmm. for, for different areas of skill or, 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 or life. So I think um, the most fundamental definition we could probably take is that it is the capacity to make decisions recognized by the law, right? And so the judgment of 
what de determines whether or not somebody has the capacity to make decisions that are recognized by the law. That's what varies, right? And in New Zealand, these two things are currently overlaid in that it is viewed if you have mental capacity, you have legal capacity. If you don't have mental capacity, you don't have legal capacity. That is how our current framework is set up in New Zealand. But this is taking a very binary approach. A person has capacity or they don't. A person can make decisions or they can't. But in reality, we are all human beings. We're all nuanced. We all have good days and bad days. And capacity is decision specific. I may have the capacity to make a decision about what I want for breakfast, but not a decision about where I want to live, or vice versa. I may have the capacity to make a decision about where I want to live, but I can't focus on some of those small day-to-day -day things. And it might change tomorrow. So capacity is decision specific. And so what I'm going to show you now is that they're separated. Mental capacity and legal capacity are separate. And what the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability teaches us is that everyone has a right to full legal capacity. So in other words, everyone has a right to make decisions that are recognized by the law. Now, I'm sure you're thinking about your practice, you're thinking about the people you support, and you're thinking, how does that work? I've <laughs> yes, to experience the results of their decisions. That's part of their part of the um, rights that every person has. <laughs> and we'll talk about um, safeguards around that. Uh, but these things are separate. And our law in New Zealand does not yet reflect this. So, um, as you know, there's revision, has been revision for the Mental Health Act. And there is, uh, the Law Commission has got a review program now for laws relating to adult decision-making capacity. So that includes the Protection of Personal Property and Rights Act, um, among other laws. There are a few things that it excludes. Um, like the IDCCNR Act, um, the Intellectual Disability Compulsory Care and Rehabilitation Act. But the, their review program um, is trying to uh, reconcile where we are now, which is that overlay, and trying to get it closer to looking like this, where they're separate. That mental capacity and legal capacity are viewed as separate. And while we're on the notion of capacity, um, I'd like to challenge some of the thinking around mental capacity in that I shared what that definition was, that it's about being able to understand the information and retain it, be able to forecast the outcomes and communicate. But that is all within a person. And capacity, if we're thinking about a te ao Māori lens, is broader than that. Capacity is about the net total of what I bring and my supporters and my resources that I can draw on. It can be collective. So capacity is um, broader than just what may be inside me. In, in my area of practice, um, an example of that would be where someone uh, doesn't speak English. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, yeah, non-speakers of English who come into our unit, and so they, their mental capacity is not present because they can't communicate the outcome of their decisions, but that the barrier is created externally, and mm -hmm. we can remove it with a translator or interpreter. Exactly, and I love that you've shared that example because it's a really easy to pin down example of removing the disabling factor, and that the disabling factor is external. Now, if you use that same principle and approach and apply it to everyone else, it holds true. We just need to find, for that person, how do we enable and remove the disabling factors? And I'm not saying it's easy, but this is the approach. Just making sure I've 
got in my notes, but I'm a bit scared of this laptop now. Okay, yeah, there's one other thing that I was going to say, and that is that uh, there are some other countries that are a little bit ahead of us with their own laws. Um, I'm sure you probably are familiar with some of them, um, but I'll mention one that is unexpected, and that is there's one country in the world that has taken the step of removing, of completely separating these and removing all restrictions on legal capacity. Do you know what country that is? Uh, no, you'd think, you'd oh. think. No? Oh. <laughs> no, um, I will say Ireland has got an excellent framework for supported decision making. So look that up. Um, they've got it like very concise and easy to read. It is Peru. So Peru has taken the step of fully divorcing mental capacity and legal capacity. Now, they did this a few years ago, and what we don't yet know is how they are still safeguarding. So I'm kind of watching that space with interest to see how they're doing it. Um, but they've taken the legislative steps. And so they're well ahead um, on their journey. New Zealand is not. And um, we're, we're on the journey, but not ahead. And we um, meet with the United Nations Convention every few years to report back on how we're doing. And they give us kind of a grade. How are we A plus? Are we F? And when we meet with them and we talk specifically about supported decision making, our grade is always an F. <laughs> and we met in September. Now, it's not literally an A to an F, but it's a slap on the hand. We met with them in September and we were told the same thing, that we are not doing enough to recognise and achieve the legal capacity of all people in New Zealand. This is a question for you. What role does legislation play in supported decision making? Okay, so for the people on Zoom, their answer was you can't put it aside if there is a legislative requirement. Absolutely. So it can have a role of limiting supported decision making processes. The flip side of that is that it has the potential to extend and support supported decision making processes. That's potential. <laughs> to do that. What role should it play? That's the, what we just answered. It should extend supported decision making. So what is some of the legislation that is either extending or limiting supported decision making in New Zealand? Just call out what are some of the laws? The Human Rights Act? Yeah. Health and disability, yeah. The Triple PNR Act, absolutely. Mental Health Act, yeah. Pardon? End of life choice, yeah. I'll just repeat them so that Zoom can hear. I think we've probably covered some of the main ones. Um, but internationally, the, we can point to United Nations instruments of law. Um, we also can look to things like um, the Orangatamariki Act. We could look to um, things like the Family Violence Act as well. Um, yeah, Crimes Act. I love that that was brought up. Crimes Act is something that in our safeguarding work, we rely on heavily. And I'll mention it why a little bit later. So, uh, Jenny mentioned this earlier when she was explaining what supported decision making is, and that there are guidelines that have been released um, around the Compulsory Assessment and Treatment Act. Uh, and I hope that you've all read this and you're familiar with it. Now, this document contains supported decision make the phrase supported decision making in it 
I think it's like 60 times or something. It's all through it. It is amazing. I know at this stage it's aspirational, but it's amazing. And we don't, in the disability space, we don't have anywhere near this level of embedding yet. We've got a lot of talk, but we don't have it actually contained in the documentation. Now, a companion document is the Human Rights Guide for the Act. And as Jenny said, there is a whole section on supported decision making. This is a two section document. The second section or half of it is all about supported decision making. So if you haven't looked it up, look it up. Why is there separate, a separate word? Yeah, so the question is, why is it in the Act? Is it because there were verbal consumers putting pressure on during the drafting um, or for some other reason? And I think that it's probably a combination of there being pressure in the room as well uh, from lived experience, as well as the fact that it, there is international pressure from the United Nations to be evidenced as being compliant with those international instruments of law because we're getting that slap on the hand. So there's pressure that next time we turn up, we get a glowing report. So supported decision-making is one of those pressure words that if we use it in the right context, we can get movement because officials know we need to be offering support for decision making. So that's, I think that there's a, a variety of reasons why it is in there. In general, the whole, um, the Hiara Oranga is totally shifting towards a more of a human rights and empowering approach. Um, and so when you talk about human rights and you're talking about the space, you're really talking about supported decision making. That's what it kind of boils down to. This is just a screenshot of the beginning of section two from their human rights guide. You won't be able to read the screen because uh, it's teeny tiny text, but it's more just giving you a visual that it's all in there and it's, it's a great resource. So please do use it. Um, I'm going to talk, this is a, a slide stack that I use and adapt for different audience. And this is a slide that I always have in here. And I'm not sure to what degree you use the Triple PR Act in your work. Quite a lot. Okay, because I know that people can um, have their liberties uh, restricted in other ways um, in the mental health space. But the Triple PR Act is probably in the disability space, it's, it's tough. And this is what's being reviewed. So in the middle, you can see there is the person. And you can see around the person are different orders under the Act, the Triple PR Act, the Protection of Personal and Property Rights Act. You can see that some of these orders are done to the person. They don't get a choice. Um, welfare guardian is appointed for the person. They don't get to choose who that welfare guardian is if they need a welfare guardian. Same, pardon? They get one. Yep, exactly. They get one. Now, the law doesn't say that if you are deemed as lacking mental capacity, you must have a welfare guardian. It doesn't say that. The law does say that a guardian may be appointed when somebody is deemed as lacking capacity. But as we've already talked about, this whole notion of capacity and the way that capacity is assessed is fundamentally flawed because a person doesn't just have capacity or not. It's not binary. Capacity is decision specific and capacity is about the resources and supports available as well. But welfare guardianship is when the legal decision making rights around care and welfare are taken from one person and given to another. This is substituted decision making. You're going to say something. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, in, in, in my experience of it, 
even though the doctors have human medicinal and have capacity, but Fano as a whole sat with the person and the person was able to elect who they wanted to work with for their health. So I think that there's still there is the ability to have that discussion with them and that's what they do. Yeah, I'll relay that for the people on Zoom. So it was just shared that um, one of the people in the room has been a guardian before and the, her experience of being a guardian was to work in an empowering way, which the law actually lays out to work with the person to enable them. And the person that she was supporting was able to nominate the person they wanted to support them. Now, my response to that is, thank goodness you were the guardian, <laughs> because Unfortunately, not everyone has that experience. Even though the law does say that the role of the guardian is to work with the subject person and support them to um, grow and use the degree of capacity that they do have, it's actually a, I can't think of the word right now, but um, like a misnomer. It, it's they, you've just been told that somebody doesn't have capacity, therefore they need a guardian. And then the Act says, work with them to grow the capacity they do have. How can that coexist? A person have no capacity or wholly lack capacity, and then you support them to grow it. So the law itself introduces these contradictions. And unfortunately, many guardians do not take the approach that, that the law requires and that you've taken, they don't consult, they act in an authoritarian way, and they act as the sole rights holder, well, when human rights are never taken away from a person. Maybe I'm cynical, but we don't really worry about the Triple P and R Act until there's enough blockages that the system, the services can't cope anymore, and then they say, right, we're going to have that PP uh -huh, and we'll need a welfare guardian, and mm -hmm. it's not really because the the client needs the, because the person needs the mm -hmm. PNRX, it's because the services need it. And yes. so then, of course, the person who's charged with being that welfare guardian then has to kind of, well, okay, I'll take over. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good articulation that the law, as I said earlier, the law doesn't require somebody to have a welfare guardian. But often it is other third party agencies, external agencies, whether that's hospitals or banks or the dentist or some something else ridiculous like a um a property manager or what was the other example like car, salesman. car salesman like it's all of these other people businesses agencies government officials that are risk adverse and they want somebody to sign the bottom line that they can guarantee has full mental capacity is there a recent example of that with the case of the baby and the blood transfusion at um, Yes. Thermal? Yeah. So, uh, yes, we're moving on to the next. Uh, before we move on, we've got a comment here, and then we'll move on to the other orders under the Act. It's just from someone on Zoom who's given an example of worked with a mental health patient who kept asking the legal firm appointed to act as his uh, power of attorney uh, for access to funds. Uh, he was done no repeatedly and whilst being charged every time he was declined access to his own funds. Yeah. <laughs> so it was there was a conflict of interest there and a clear business incentive to keep the requests coming because he was uh, financially benefiting from that arrangement. So we'll move on now. Um, we've got the orders that are in black. Welfare guardian is about care and welfare. Property management or property administrator, that's about property. The only difference between them is a threshold of assets. Personal orders are something that is highly customizable and open, open-ended. So you can have a personal order that is just intervening and stipulating where a person may live, but nothing else or just stepping in and stipulating um, a, an example with an advocacy case that we were working with, the removal of someone's passport to keep them safe, but not interfering in any other decision-making domains. So those are what personal orders are, and personal orders are underutilized in the Act. There's this deference to go to the most extreme, to the welfare guardian or the property management orders, but those are the most restrictive, those are the most intervention 
orders that is in any of our laws in New Zealand. Across the board, these are the most this, this, the most restrictive, the most degree of intervention. So the grey box, this one is different. The person <laughs> on that screen is purple. Um, there on this screen, it's, it's grey. But with this one, the person is choosing. And that is a world of difference. So enduring power of attorney, the person is deemed as having capacity. They appoint their attorney who they want to act for them in the future if and when they lose capacity. So everyone in this room should have an enduring power of attorney for the unfortunate event if you get hit by a bus tomorrow. The enduring power of attorney is then becomes that decision maker for you in the future. But you were able to appoint them. You don't get to appoint your welfare guardian. Now, with enduring power of attorney, you still need to you need to choose carefully, and it can be revoked by either party while the person still has capacity. Um, we were in an advocacy um, case just recently where somebody um, had stage four cancer. They were in palliative, receiving palliative care. They had an enduring power of attorney, their brother that they had appointed, and this brother had started acting on his behalf, but actually. No GP had ever signed off that he'd lacked capacity yet, that he'd crossed over some threshold. And this became a real tension between these brothers in the last season of this man's life. And an advocate was needed to come in and educate around the Triple PR Act, educate around this person's rights to continue to act. He still had his legal capacity as defined by New Zealand's law. So during power of attorney, once it's in place, it can be revoked, but otherwise it stays in place forever. Whereas these other orders have expiries on them and they need to be renewed. And there's a fee associated with that. It's normally uh, an interval of about three years. Yeah. We... We were educating the uh, the person who ha who had the advanced cancer that he actually did have his rights because he had kind of been um, told he didn't anymore. So we were educating him. We were educating the brother that was acting as the enduring power of attorney, and we were we were educating the. It was actually a, um, a rest home facility. He was receiving in palliative care within a rest home facility, and they had deferred completely to the to the brother who was named as next of kin and a during power of attorney, they hadn't done any fact checking to check if if it was enacted or not. So me having an enduring power of attorney is not the same thing as me having an enacted enduring power of attorney. And whenever you're working with somebody who says, oh yeah, I'm a welfare guardian for so-and-so, or I'm the enduring power of attorney, always ask to see the piece of paper. So there is no central record that keeps a, a, a log, lodge of who, who has an attorney or a guardian appointed, who is acting as an attorney or a guardian. It doesn't exist. And so for our, um, professionals, clinicians trying to find this information out, it's very difficult. But if somebody is directly telling you that they have this order appointed, ask to see the evidence. Because very often parents assume that they have guardianship of their 20-year-old. They don't. But then when he decided he lost his capacity, he just said, okay, there you go and gave it to my partner. Okay. But it was hard work to get it then once he'd agreed to it, to get it actually lodged so that she could do that. Yes, and the, same as what and the scenario you've just said about your father-in-law getting to a point where he said, okay, here you go, that may have worked within that family dynamic, but process-wise, that's not how it works. You need a, a medical professional to assess and sign off, okay, capacity is now gone. I can't decide I've got capacity. Unfortunately, I'd like to, <laughs> but it needs to be done by a medical professional. And the law 
um, well, the Triple PR Act anyway, doesn't actually put in strict uh, requirements around what that what the role is of that medical professional. It just says that they're duly and suitably qualified. So it could be a GP or it could be a um, psychologist. There's lots of different um, clinicians that it could be. We generally say in the first instance, go for the medical professional that knows them best and the longest. Because it's especially if it's about enduring power of attorney, because it's about change. I'm going to move on from the Triple PR Act because that's only one of the acts, and you guys work under the, the Mental Health Act more. Um, we're going to talk practically how do you do it? So we've talked a lot on the high high principle based stuff, but how do you actually do supported decision making? And there's some steps. Uh, there was some research done by IHC and they interviewed 114 people with learning disabilities and they said, what helps you make your decisions? And there were lots of answers that came up. Some of the things were like um, having really good, easy to understand information, having people that I trust. Um, but one of the most significant answers that came back was having decisions broken down into little chunks. So we're going to break this process down into little chunks. The first step of decision making is to describe what the decision even is. Now, this may sound ridiculously obvious, but it's a step that is missed out so often. People ask to decide and they don't even fully know what they're deciding about. Having accessible information is key. Exploring options. And we'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail soon. Considering the consequences, then and only then, at step five, is the action of actually make or making the decision and then acting on it is a completely different step. And then reviewing. Now, these steps are adapted from a guide that IHC has published, which is a toolkit for supporters of decision making, which I would encourage you to look at. Now, we're going to go do a little exercise now. We are going to uh, we're going to go through this uh, this this process, but we're going to do it. Um, it's going to be challenging. So decide now. We're starting this process. We're making a decision together. I'm asking you to decide now. Can you do that? No, <laughs> no. What was that? You need the information about what you're deciding on. Yeah. Yes, yes. We need to go back to step number one. We need to describe the decision. Now, as ridiculous as this example seems, this happens all the time. People ask, okay, you need, we need a decision from you right now. And a person hasn't, this is step number five, and they haven't even gone through steps one, two, three, and four. Okay, so let's go back a little. Oh, sorry, you've got a comment? An example would be uh, sign this consent form. Yes. I yep. mean, that does happen. Yep, sign this consent form. Um, that is saying decide now. We need it now because X, Y, and Z is dependent on you signing it now. Okay, let's go back a little bit. This is now the question. Can you decide now? No. I, I, I was hoping that nobody in the room spoke Sanskrit or read Sanskrit <laughs> so that I could uh, use this example. But this is describing the question, why can't you decide? It's not accessible to you. So you need to describe. It needs to be accessible. So translate to your coffee. Okay, so that's the question, tea or coffee. Now, some of you may be able to jump right from tea or coffee to step five, and you can now make a decision because you've got experience that you can draw on. Jenny. Yep. So it's ambiguous. Tea or coffee? Yes. Or do you want tea or coffee? So the question could be rephrased to be more specific, to be clearer. But uh, while you may be able to make a decision based off of your experience base, others may not have an experience base. And so the next step was exploring options. 
trying to introduce a bit of an experience base. And when you're exploring options, you want that exploration to be as experiential and sensory as possible. So if you're talking about tea and coffee, you don't just want to say tea or coffee. You want to smell the coffee. You want to have a taste of the, of the tea. You want to feel the temperature. You want to experience with all of your senses as much as possible to explore those options. Now, this is a trivial example, but apply the principles. Um, the next step, considering consequences, is critical. Now, I've got an example of this that I'll just share briefly, that we had one of our advocates, um, so one of the services we provide is lifelong advocacy for people that are enrolled members of the trust. And so we had an advocate that was working with a lifelong member, and so they'd know, been working together for a number of years, they knew each other well. And the advocate came to the service provider one day and the service provider said, just so you know, Johnny has a do not resuscitate notice. He's just, we've just signed it off. We put it in his file. So for context, Johnny was chronically unwell. Um, and the service provider said, but don't worry. We did support a decision making with him. We, we explained it all. We, we, um, showed him a video about what it means. And he said he he did not want that. He did not want what was on the video. So we did our supported decision making. And the advocate luckily said, um, okay, I'll just revisit this with him and I can independently confirm or otherwise that this was his choice. And so she went through with him this process and she found that they had skipped over step four, considering consequences. So he had seen this video about somebody having all of these contraptions put on them and pressure put on them, and that didn't look good to him. He said, no, I don't want that. They hadn't, like unbelievably, they hadn't explained that if he didn't have that, that meant that he would die. And he did understand the permanency of death. And so... The advocate was able to work and remove that do not resuscitate notice from the person's file. Now, when we talk about consequences, that's kind of as big as they get. And yet, it was missing from the conversation. So, please make sure it's not missing from yours, from your processes. Then after that, you make your decision. Acting on the decision is a separate step. And sometimes people may need support for some of these steps and not others. Maybe somebody needs a sounding board to talk through steps one to five, and then they're fine to go away and act and do it. But or it might be the reverse. They may have considered and thought and made a decision, but they need some support to act on it. And so the support that's offered needs to be tailored to the decision and the person. And then probably the most important step of all is to review. All of us learn from the decisions that we make. And the ones that we learn the most from are our poor decisions. And everyone has the right to make poor decisions and to learn from those poor decisions. So what are some other supports that exist? We've talked about people facilitating a process and people acting as supporters. But what are some other tools Having practice, just more and more exposure of decision making, being empowered to make decisions. That is an important part of supported decision making. Using communication aids, um, we have a speech language therapist in the room who will be able to talk all about communication aids. Talking mats is one that we use frequently. Advanced directives, this is an important supported decision making tool, um, one that is underutilized. And one that probably has particular relevance for the field of mental health. You talk about it a lot. Do you do it a lot? No. Yeah. And so when we talk about the, the work that needs to be done in this space around supported decision making, we're talking about workforces that need education and capability development. We're talking about um, doctors, we're talking about lawyers, we're talking about bankers, we're talking about um, um, disability service providers, mental health nurses, we're talking about everyone. Now, we're getting to the point, yes? 
it's a murky area of law right now. And so you would have some lawyers that would interpret that, yes, there is, and some other lawyers that would say, no, there isn't. And it, part of what makes it murky is that there's not a clear process around when they are set and determining that at the point that they are set, the person had capacity. So I'm optimistic that this will be improved, the legal standing of advanced directors will be improved as part of the Law Commission's review of all laws relating to adult decision making capacity. I, uh, it's happening right now. So that review by the Law Commission is happening right now, just on the, e the end of February, beginning of March is when the first round of consultation and submissions closed and they have already released their preliminary issues paper. Um, I think in November, they're scheduled to issue their second final, uh, I don't know if it's their final, but their second summary paper, and they'll have another round of engagement at that point. So engage with the Law Commission on this review, because there's a whole lot of things that are bundled into adult decision-making capacity, and advanced directives are one of them. It is a specific area of focus for that review. So what you're saying is that once that legislation is passed, those advanced directors, the medical team will have to consider it before they start the you know, the that is certainly the hope. Certainly the hope. Um, I believe that there will be a flow on effects, but I don't know if it will directly change the Mental Health Act. It's kind of, it's a separate work program, unfortunately, in the eyes of the law. And also they have to, they have to, uh, because it's a suite. It's it, they all work together. And the other thing I'll just clarify is that. What the Law Commission is doing is reviewing the law and making recommendations for change, but they actually, the Law Commission has no power to change anything. So that's why I say I'm optimistic, but we'll see. Um, a couple of other supports. Now, I'm mindful we're at the point where I normally would stop and we talk about questions, but we're just having a chat, so I'm going to keep going and raise questions as they come up. So um, other tools, preference banks, does anyone know what I mean by that? No. So it is kind of like an advanced directive. It's when a person is able to capture the information about what their preferences are and then communicate that with other people for a future time when they may not have capacity, if they have episodic periods of mental ill health. How? Uh, yes. It seems like the preference bank would be easier to dismiss than an advanced directive. So, yes, in some ways, a preference bank doesn't have a legal status. But the thing about a preference bank is that it covers off the things that aren't just happening in the hospital. It covers off things like, um, well, it's, it, there's no constraints on what it might cover. So you could say that you like uh, capture a preference about the type of washing powder that you like to use, which doesn't cause you a skin irritation. Like that's not going to be in an advanced directive, but it could actually be really important for your comfort on a day-to-day -day basis. And you could record it in a preference bank. Now, when I talk about preference banks, they're it's it's a fluid concept concept and it's something that is up for individual interpretation. Some people go and write it down. Some people have spreadsheets. Um, there is an app that's being developed to centralize and store that information and then share it. Um, but it's it's a growing concept. So in the southern DHB region, we have uh, mental health advanced preferences. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the guys don't want to do them because they see it almost as like another paper exercise, but it covers things not only about going into hospital, but it's things like, I have a dog at home. If I end up in hospital, this is who I want to look after them. Yeah. So it isn't just about their treatment. It's about everything that's going on in their lives. If they if they end up in this situation, they end up in hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love that it is broad because a person is more than being unwell. 
So, yep. Yeah, now I probably should disclose that I wear two hats. One of them is as a director of the Personal Advocacy and Safeguarding Adults Trust, and another hat is that I'm a founder of an organization that is developing it, an app, a preference bank app. So um, full disclosure. Your advanced directive. 100%. And the intention is that in the future, they will be able to, the reference bank itself will house and then communicate that formal advanced directive in addition to all of that other ancillary stuff. So if you're interested, the name is Volition. Okay, the other thing, the, maybe the most important, is time. So we've talked about people, we've talked about communication aids, we've talked about reference banks. But at the end of the day, if you don't have time to go through this process, to have these conversations, then you're undercutting the whole process. In support of decision making, time might be the single biggest and most important factor. And if a person had more time, they may be able to make decisions themselves. Now, I know that sometimes in mental health, time is what you don't have. Um, so we do the best that we can. Um, oh, this is a specific resource that I wanted to just highlight because I don't, it's something that we've talked a lot about in the disability space. I don't know if it is well known yet in the mental health space. So I wanted to introduce it to you. And this is a resource, a framework that has been introduced by Tupo Ufakara Nui. And it is the Equitable Access to Wellbeing Framework, which is specifically for um, the disability and mental health and addiction workforce is providing support for people with autism or learning disability who experience mental distress and addiction. Who's seen this? Thought so. Here you go. Happy Friday. Go look it up because this is an excellent resource. It sets out um, core skills right from essential to advanced levels for the workforce and it takes you through including in that supported decision making approaches okay we're going to go pretty quickly through this because we're getting near the end um, identifying vulnerabilities and safeguarding so we talked about how it's important to enable people to make poor decisions but we also need to acknowledge that sometimes those poor decisions may have significant risk attached with them. And we need to, we have an obligation and duty of care to protect from harm. So um, it's something to be mindful of, and I'll talk about it with the next screen as well. Um, and we, another thing to safeguard against is undue, infl undue influence or conflict of interest. So that lawyer example and a conflict of interest earlier, um, we've had many many advocacy situations where a person is adamantly saying they don't want support but really it's their mum saying they don't want support who say who, then the person is relaying that voice that they don't want support and it's it's an unsafe situation so undue influence is something to be very very careful of I'm moving a little bit faster through here so we can get to the end um, I want to talk about will and preference so Will and preference is something that almost whenever you hear supported decision making being spoken about, you'll hear will and preference being spoken about because it is included in the United Nations Convention. And will and preference is can be either expressed by the person. They can say, my preference is coffee. Or it can be interpreted through behaviors. And it's really important to acknowledge that preference can sometimes be interpreted through behaviors. And I will put it out to you that everything that can breathe has the ability to express preference. <laughs> Even plants, if you can breathe, you can express preference through changing the pattern of your breath, through changing the position of your body, through um, changing vocalizations, through eye contact, through a number, innumerable other ways. If you can breathe, you can communicate preference. And so supported decision-making is about making sure that decisions to the greatest degree possible are in line with the person's preferences. Now, will and preference, these words go hand in hand. 
But in reality, they don't always because will refers to like an, a long-term enduring intention and preference is what I want right now. So um, I have three kids and I can tell you that when I went into hospital for when I was in labor with my first child, my will was to have a natural childbirth. Now, I can tell you that my preferences changed from one hour one to when we got to about hour 36. My preferences changed. And so preferences sometimes may be in conflict with your will. And so there's a balance there. that You might have an, an older adult who their whole life had um, a will to be active and be outdoors. And then the older that they get, their preferences are changing that's okay. There's all there will be a sometimes a conflict between a person's will and preference. Sometimes they'll just be beautifully aligned, but not always. Um, preference banks, we've talked about that already. And then will and preference is from the person. That's the only place that it can come from. Now, this is in contrast to best interests. Best interests comes from external sources. That's not to say it's not valid, but it's not from the person. It's other people's assessment of what would be best for me. Now, we want to firstly exercise positive presumption, presume that a person has the capacity until it's evidence that they don't. And what do we do when there is a conflict between will and preference and best interests? That happens all the time, right? All the time. That's probably where all of the sticking points of your work boil down to. Somebody wants to do something different than what maybe you or other professionals believe is in their best interests. This is never going to be straightforward. It's always going to be subjective and gray and sticky. Um, but a guiding light is to give when there's a conflict, to give primacy to will and preference while introducing proportionate and appropriate safeguards. You, you were hoping that I was going to give you a silver bullet that, that solved the problem. That doesn't exist. But if you can give as much primacy to will and preference and introduce appropriate safeguards. There is, there is an example which is really common in our inpatient unit mm -hmm. around, um, the, so the Mental Health Act spells out uh, statutory rights that mm -hmm. a patient under the Mental Health Act has, one of which is to make and receive telephone calls at reasonable times. Now, it's surprisingly often people decide to be quite unreasonable with their phone use. Mm -hmm. um, so then there's the caveat at the end of that, which says, unless the responsible clinician decides it is not in the best interest of the patient. Mm -hmm. So here you've, you've, you've got the language of best interest in the, in the, in the legislation. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when the patient is repeatedly calling 111? <laughs> and, and so, I mean, in practice, so look, an example of how we manage this in practice is when their, their preference is to call 111 and say, I've, I've been abducted. Please, yeah. please I'm held against my will. <laughs> yeah. I'm being held against my will, and the and the um the, psychiatrist, the responsible clinician decides it's not in the best the person's best interests to be maintained in a state of distress mm -hmm. repeatedly. The way that we manage this is to give primacy to the mm -hmm. will and preference, which is to, but also to test capacity. So we say if you continue doing this, the consequences will be. Yeah. Can you understand this? So that's that was going to be my response: is that everyone has the right to make their decisions and receive support for their decisions and receive, experience the outcomes of their decisions. And so if you are making a decision that is inappropriate with the phone, when you're given access to the phone, the outcome of that decision is that you may not be offered the phone next time. And that is a natural consequence. It's interesting watching that phase in and out where, okay, I don't ring the police. Until yep. I do ring the police, you know, because that right capacity, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So how do we make sure it happens? Um, all I really want to speak to on this um, slide, because I'm mindful that I'm at time, it's 2.30 now. So um, all I really want to speak to here is to say, don't wait for the legislation to change. Don't wait for 
um, a special guide, although you actually have a guide. So, so you are better positioned than most to use supported decision making, become supported decision making ambassadors, become supported decision making experts. And the way you do that is by practicing, by doing it. Take your time and then just do it. Make mistakes, but do it. And that's how we make sure, the only way we make sure it happens. We don't wait for others, we just do it. Now, I won't even progress. I've got a few more slides. Um, I won't even progress because time is through. And this is what always happens. I just keep going and I love it. So um, I'll stop there. Um, if you'd like to learn more about our organization, we provide advocacy and safeguarding for adults with care and support needs in New Zealand. Now, our trust deed previously said that that was for the learning disability community, but we changed that in 2019, and now it just says any adult with care and support needs. So that can include adults with experience of mental illness and distress. Now, we're still learning in this space. We've got 50 years plus worth of background experience working in the disability sector. So we are new and learning in this space, but we want to be in this space. So look us up and we would love to help. And thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Erica, that's pretty fantastic. Um, and so thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. Um, your knowledge is amazing to stand there and talk all that um, background is, is really great and um, we appreciate it. Um, I'm sure everybody's learned something. Um, and just so thank you. Thank you very much. That's still going, even though I've taken my thing out. So, <laughs> doesn't make sense. I will, I think I found a way to turn it off. Yes. There we go. Thank, Thank you. you. So, um, really interesting that Eric was talking before. Um, around the, the, the difference between we now have a Ministry of Disabilities, but it doesn't include mental health. And so we have now, um, in my area of practice, I do a service coordination. So that's looking at people's supports needs and what we have access to in our communities, which varies hugely amongst the, across the country. Mm -hmm. One of the things is there are very, very siloed pots of funding around who can access what in the community. And I think this um, only goes to actually make it more siloed because our folks with mental health distress and mental health disability aren't included now in this ministry. So where do they actually fit? So, um, yeah, so I think moving forward, that's going to be a, a big um, area of advocacy for mental health clinicians around what sort of um, resources do our, our people have out in the community. <clears throat> so um, we've pretty much come to the end of our day, a bit shortened day um, for various reasons, but um, we will send out Harena's um, presentation to you once we have it, and please be um, listen to that because I'm sure that that is also um, full of wise words. Um, certificates for attendance today and an evaluation certificate will be emailed out to all registrants. And I really just want to thank you for coming. Thank you for participating. I think the, the connection between the speakers and the audience has been really good, both the people in the room and with our people on Zoom today. So that's really great. Um, we have taken a few photos today, which we might put on our Facebook page. So if anybody has any objections to any of photos being put on that page, please come and see Grant Katie before we leave today. Um, and otherwise, just so thank you so much.
Um, also, say thank you to our sponsors. So we got some um, sponsorship money from Douglas Pharmaceuticals and from NZNO's um, Nursing Education Fund. So we'd just like to thank them for supporting our forum as well. So hopefully we might do this again in a couple of years' time or potentially sooner. So, um, yeah, great day. So I hope you've all enjoyed it, had a nice lunch and have a nice afternoon. Um, <laughs> You know, just like to ask where to end the day with Karakia, please. Yep. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so we're just gonna lift the restrictions that we've had here today, uh, clear the way forward and return to our daily lives. Kia faka iri te tapu, kia wati ai te ara, kia tūruki whakataai, kia tūruki whakataai, aumia hui e tai ki e. I <laughs> think